Good morning and welcome to the July 2023 board meeting of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency or the MHRA as we prefer to call ourselves. My name is Stephen Lightfoot and I'm the chair of the board and my role today is to lead us through the agenda. Now for those of you who've not attended one of our board meetings before I must start by reminding everyone that this is a board meeting held in public and it is not a public meeting. It's also important to explain that the board is responsible for agreeing the strategic direction of the agency, maintaining high standards of corporate governance and scrutinizing the performance of the MHRA. But it's equally important to say that the board does not make any regulatory decisions on any individual medicines or medical devices. And that's because these regulatory decisions are made by the ministers in the Department of Health and Social Care on the recommendation of MHRA officials who themselves are independent civil servants, with the additional independent advice from our expert advisory committees, such as the Commission on Human Medicines. Now, as far as today's meeting is concerned, I also need to make you aware that we'll be recording the meeting so we can publish the video, video on our website to provide the opportunity for as many people as possible to observe uh, what the board does. Now, on that note, I'm pleased to uh, report that 67 people have registered to observe our meeting live today with 26 members of the public or representatives from patient groups, 25 uh, people from industry, four from media outlets, and 12 members of staff. So welcome uh, to each and every one of you, and thank you for joining us this morning. Now, with introductions in mind, I'd just like to go around the room and ask my colleagues on the board to introduce themselves so the audience know who we all are. So as I said, my name is Stephen Lightfoot, and I'm the chair of the board. June. Good morning. I'm June Rain. I'm the CEO at MHRA. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Whitehouse. I'm a non-executive director. Uh, I'm Graham Cook, a non-executive director. Good morning. I'm Laura Squire. I'm Chief Healthcare Quality and Access Officer for the MHRA. Good morning. I'm Hader Hussain, non-executive director. Good morning. I'm Mandy Calvert, and I'm a non-executive director. Good morning, I'm Mark Bailey. I'm the Chief Science and Innovation Officer for the MHRA. Good morning, I'm Rachel Bosworth. I'm Director of Communications and Engagement for the MHRA. Good morning, I'm Natalie Richards. I'm the Head of the Executive Office. Uh, good morning, Paul Goldsmith, Non-Executive Director. Good morning, Claire Harrison, Chief Digital and Technology Officer at MHRA. Good morning, Rose Braithwaite, Chief Finance Officer at MHRA. Good morning, Raj Long, Non-Executive Director. Good morning, Glenn Wells, Chief Partnerships Officer at the MHRA. Good morning, Mercy Jesse, I'm Non-Executive Director. Good morning, Carly McGurry, Director of Governance. Okay, thank you, colleagues. I appreciate that very much. So you should all have access to the board pack of uh, papers for today's meeting, uh, and I'll use the page numbers in the board pack to keep us all on track. I'll also assume that everyone has read the papers um, so that we can spend most of our time on discussion. Now, in addition to our usual items, we've also got a, you know, a number of quite important additional items this week, um, and they include our annual report and accounts, uh, our science strategy, and also an important update on our response to the Cumberledge Review. So uh, I look forward to debating each of those. Now, although this is not a public meeting, we will provide an opportunity for members of the public to ask the board specific questions about the items on today's agenda when we've finished our board discussions. And this can be done using the chat function um, on, on Zoom webinar. Now, it's also important that members of the public are aware that the board cannot see any of the comments in the chat here in this room while the meeting is taking place, because that's only used by our communications colleagues to collate the questions for the question and answer session at the end. And finally, if you do want to ask a question that's not related to today's board agenda, then our, our advice is to please contact our customer experience center directly and they'll be able to help you. So that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. Uh, is that clear colleagues and have I missed anything? No, nope, that seems everyone's content. Okay, that being the case then, uh, let's move on to the agenda itself at the start of the pack. So I've described uh, what we're doing today and who the board directors are. Um, we've got apologies for absence from Alison Strath, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer in Scotland, from Greg Chalmers, uh, the Head of the CMO Policy Division in Scotland, and also Cathy Harrison, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer in Northern Ireland. 
We've also had apologies from Catherine Glover, the Deputy Director for Medicines in the Department of Health, who would normally be joining us, but unfortunately is ill today. We've also been caught by a couple of travel arrangements. So unfortunately, Alison Cave, our Chief Safety Officer, and Junaid Bajwa, one of our non-executive directors, have been delayed. We are expecting them both to join during the meeting this morning. So that's really by way of introduction. Um, if we just move on to page number three, please, uh, that's the declarations of interest. Um, can I just ask if there are any new declarations that have not already been made aware, uh, visible to the board? No new declarations. So on that basis, then we can approve the, uh, the, the declarations or register. Um, Having just considered the topics on the agenda, uh, I think my proposal is that we don't need to take any further actions to mitigate uh, any conflicts in this particular meeting. So I don't think we need to ask anyone to leave for any of the individual items. That's my view. Can I just check that the board's content with that? Yep, I'm seeing a nod around the table. So in that basis, then I think we can proceed, we quore it and we can carry on. So if we move on to page number seven, uh, we've got the minutes of the last meeting. Um, can first of all, I just check that they're an accurate record of the discussions that we held back on the 16th of May. I'm seeing some nods around the table. Okay, so thank you for that. So on that basis, Natalie, if we can record in the minutes that these minutes are approved, thank you very much. If we then just move on to um, the actions, uh, that's on page number 13. Um, we can see a number of actions there and just to quickly... Uh, find them on my screen here. Um, the first item, action number 29, about the science strategies on the agenda. So we'll come to that in a moment. We've then got a, no a number of items, number 71, number 88, 89, 93, 94, and 96, that are proposed for closure because we've completed the actions. Um, and that leaves us at, on action number 98 around the approval of the draft corporate plan and the preparation of a business plan. Um, Rose, can you just give us a, a brief verbal update in terms of how the corporate plan approval is progressing and the business plan? Thank you. Yes. So the um, business plan, the corporate plan obviously was launched on the, the 4th of July, which is great. And the business plan is now going through the approvals process in the department. So it will be published. It's on track to be published this month. Perfect. OK, so that's uh, so when that's done, I think we can close that action as well. Then thank you very much for that update. So there are all the actions as, as I see it. Can I just check if there were any other matters arising from any of the meeting items or the actions? No. OK. That's great. Well, let's move straight on then uh, into the first of the substantive items. Um, so uh, the, the, the production of an annual report is a really major activity within the agency. And uh, our Audit and Risk Assurance Committee has been steering uh, and, and maintaining the board's oversight on this particular process. So, Michael, we've got an Audit and Risk Assurance Committee report to start us off with. Uh, again, that's on page number 15. Um, you can assume we've read it, but are there any key points you'd like to bring to our attention, Michael? Uh, just three points, Chair. Firstly, um, as recorded in the report, um, the way is now clear for the board to formally approve the uh, agency's annual report and accounts. Um, Rose Braithwaite and I um, met with the NAO yesterday afternoon, and they have confirmed that they will be issue advising the Control and Auditor General to issue a clear audit opinion and he will sign the accounts uh, on Friday. So the way is clear for the agency to meet its statutory responsibilities to lay its accounts and annual reports before Parliament, before Parliament goes into recess. Um, the accounts that you've got before you are complete. Um, I think there is one area where some figures need to be inserted, and that is the um, comparative figures for 2020, sorry, 2020. 21, 22, um, that's a new reporting requirement, but those figures have all, all been completed um, and there is no reason to question their validity. So the way is way is clear. Um, before I go on to my next point, I would like to commend uh, my personal thanks, but also the thanks of the board, I think, to Rose and her team for the excellent work that was done in completing the financial statements and getting the clear audit opinion to Carly and her governance team for the work that was done in drafting the annual report, which is a major exercise in the governance statement, and also the work of uh, Rachel and the comms team. I think it's an excellent result. 
um, all round. So that's really positive news. Um, two other points I'd make. Um, June, as accounting officer, there is a clear requirement placed upon the accounting officer to take assurance from the work of internal audit. Internal audit every year are required uh, under Treasury requirements to issue a statement which summarises their overall assessment of the agency's control environment. And this relates to financial control, delivering value for money and systems control. It's a very generalised statement. Um, so this is the second year that they've given limited assurance. As I've said in the report, um, I think this is not surprising given the degree of change that the agency has undergone over the last uh, two to three years. But um, to put it a little bit of humour, um, two years is OK, three is not. Uh, and I think we really, really need to be clear going forward that we need to remove that mm -hmm. limited assurance. Uh, yesterday, the head, the new head of internal audit um, sent me a summary of how he feels the agency can get to a more positive position. Uh, and I've suggested that he shares that with the executive team. But this needs to be a priority for the remainder of this financial year. I know June, as chief, uh, as accounting officer, really understands that. And I would really emphasise the importance of the whole executive team getting behind this work now going forward. And then my final point, um, we have as a committee focused uh, quite extensively over the last year on health and safety. The one outstanding item is the SAPO licence uh, and where I believe we now have somebody appointed who's undergoing training, which means that the way should be clear for us to get the full SAPO licence reinstated. Um, I think that needs to be our priority. And again, talking to the chief executive, I know that is very much in her sights. So, Chair, that's all I really wanted to say. Open to questions. OK, thank you very much, Michael. I think that's all very clear. Um, June, is there any initial response that you'd like to make of any of Michael's comments before I open it up? Well, thank you, Stephen. I would like to just <clears throat> endorse the amount of change that there has been and the focus throughout on creating a stronger risk management environment where governance has really stepped up. And I feel much more confident that we have the risk management that we need in place. There have been changes in internal audit, and I'm very much looking forward to working with the new lead in his, uh, if you like, assessment as a fresh view of what changes the executive need to be making. So I think it's really within our grasp now. Uh, last point being SAPO4, again, just to emphasize that the uh, further work that's being done is being accelerated, and we're looking forward to reinstating that capability, which is vital to the agency's ability yeah. to contribute to public health protection. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, um, Mercy, you had a question. Uh, it's uh, really more a request, I think. Uh, so patient involvement was one of the internal audits um, and the um, patient engagement and um, safety committee haven't seen it, uh, seen the recommendations yet. So I, I know there was some, you know, kind of honing down on, on what needed um, to be recommended. Um, but um, I think that would be really good if, if it comes to our committee as well, because obviously you want to take those recommendations forward. Yeah. Uh, Carly, just bring you in on that one. In, in terms of you know, that particular report, can we make sure that is scheduled into Mercy's committee? Yes, absolutely. We can share that. OK, so I think if we can take an action there, please, Natalie, uh, you know, for the for the governance team to ensure that we join the dots on that one. I think that's yeah. that's very helpful. So we need to make sure that patient involvement, internal audit gets to the patient safety and engagement committee. OK, Graham. Thanks. Um, I just, want, just wanted to pick up on, on 5.1. Where you note that there's a high proportion of risk on the risk register that are red, and you were looking for more assurance. I just wondered if you'd had that assurance and and what you'd found. Um, uh, it's a really it's a really good question. Um, what you see in the risk register is a wide range of actions that are intended to mitigate the risk. Um, I think we're assured about the actions; they seem to be the right things that need to be done. Um, well, I think where we want more assurance is well, when will these actions begin to have an impact yeah. uh, in terms of mitigating some of those risks? Uh, and I think that's that's really all I can say at this point. Um, 
Carly and I have been talking about this to some extent, and we'll continue to monitor it over the uh, over the over the coming months. But I would, I don't think it's particularly good that everything is rated red, and I don't think that's a fair assessment of where the agency is at the moment. So I think it's a question mark really of of looking at those mitigating actions, understanding the time scale, are they having the right impact on the risks? And is the action proportionate to the risk in the first place? So I think it, there needs to be a bit more of debate around that. I believe the um, this was discussed at the executive yesterday or the day before. Was that right, Carly? I can't remember. Um, not not on this uh, item in, in isolation, but in relation to uh, various risks on the risk register. So we do have work in hand both to revisit the risk mm. appetite to ensure that we are having... Apologies. Um, we do have work in hand to ensure that we are revisiting the appetite as a full agency exercise to ensure we've got that really forensic understanding of where do we need to take action to drive risk down to an acceptable level and where are we willing to tolerate risk in order to, to pursue our aims. Um, I would completely agree with what Michael said in terms of getting more uh, mature in tracking through the actions that are being taken and what impact they are having in bringing us down. So we agreed, um, excuse me, at the ARAC meeting to provide more detail about how those risks are moving over time. So, yeah. so I, I can't remember when we would see that at board. When would we get a sense of that? Um, so risks are currently scheduled for board in November. Um, ARAC essentially discussed them at every ARAC meeting. Um, but of course, we can always change that schedule up. The maturity, the risk appetite work uh, will be concluded late summer. Uh, so autumn time will, will be a good. So November good probably about right then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, probably is that. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a constant challenge. I think Graham uh, is the reality. Uh, the agencies, you know, continued as most organisations do, to identify risks. Um, I think something that uh, we're starting to explore in my NHS board is actually the trajectory, the trajectory, because actually you might have a red risk, but actually are you confident the actions are having an impact? And almost a, a, an up arrow and a down arrow starts to help to visibly show that. And I think as, as, it, as the organization becomes more mature, the risk appetite statement itself is helpful, but that doesn't solve it. It is actually the impact of the mitigations. And I think that's probably where, and, and I know that ARAC will continue to uh, pursue that. But November probably, I would suggest, is about the right time, Graham, to allow you know, the, the executive time to work their way through this and to have a couple of iterations. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions for Michael's report? Well, thank you, Michael. I think I appreciate your report very much and also the timely way that you've put that together. So really appreciate that. Okay, that leads us on in, in a related paper, which is then in terms of the next item, which is on page number 19. Is, and that's how well does the uh, annual report and accounts reflect the performance, governance and financial results of the MHRA over the last year? Uh, Michael's always commend, or, already commended the absolute amount of work there, Carly, uh, but any introductory comments you'd like to make on this item? Thank you, Stephen. Um, I, I won't say much uh, because I think it is set out uh, in the paper uh, and, and we've had Michael's um, report. Um, I think we have continued to build this year uh, on the value of the report uh, and it very much seeks to fulfil the spirit of our commitment to transparency by setting out in a really clear and accessible way uh, what we've achieved and how we have um, performed. Uh, in the paper, I've I've talked about the work that we've done on the performance indicators. And I think with the corporate plan now published for the next three years, uh, this becomes a genuine companion piece yeah. uh, and provides the virtual um, cycle of, of information. Uh, and we can signpost to the, to the information that we have proactively set out in it. And um, we're very pleased with the um, feedback we've had both from, from ARIC, from the internal auditor and from um, National Audit Office on the quality of the report this year. Uh, and of course, the, fine, the audit has concluded successfully. The only other thing to say is just to let board members know that the report will be designed in the style of the corporate plan. So it will look a little bit different before it's, before it's published. That's all I wanted to add. Great. Thank you for that. And, and I think it's probably worth just making members of the public uh, aware that uh, we're not allowed to uh, publish in the public domain our annual report as a draft. Uh, it has to be approved by this board first and then laid in Parliament before we can that, make, put that into the public domain. So to uh, 
accommodate that, what we've done is to circulate a final draft uh, of 130 odd pages uh, to the board separately. So that's why uh, members of the public won't be able to see the final draft. But I can assure you that the board have seen that and had the opportunity to comment on it. And many of us have during that particular process. So again, thank you for that. Can I just check from uh, the board's perspective, having reviewed the final draft, um, any specific questions or comments? I'm seeing no particular questions. Rose, can I maybe just bring you in just to just to say a few words around the way the financial results have been put together uh, and, and your level of confidence? You know, obviously, Michael mentioned that from the audit perspective. Uh, but obviously, we're making comparisons in a different way because we've had to state our accounts in a different way. Would you just like to sort of make a reference to that, please? Yes, of course. So um, the only thing missing in terms of the annual report and accounts is just the comparatives actually from the segmental reporting, yeah. which is mostly the impact of our restructure last year. So we've taken a little bit of time to ensure that those are correct. And they have now been signed off by the auditors. So they will be going into the accounts or well, they are in the latest version of the accounts that yeah. will go for um, setting into the new um, formatting yeah. for publication. Um, but otherwise, all of the numbers are are there and audited. There may be some, we obviously are doing final um, review to make sure that they are all correct. Yeah. So there may be a few final tweaks, but nothing major uh, yeah. as they have been signed off by the auditors. Yeah, and, and from an accounting point of view, the board is obviously aware that uh, you know we can't do those in the same format as our normal management uh, uh, reporting. So they're actually presented in a way that uh, is required through yeah. government accounting. Yes, that's right. And therefore, um, as, I, as, as I noted, um, the way they are presented now is that it's a total operating... Um, outgoing yeah. um, rather than a surplus or a loss, which we've seen in prior years. Yeah. So they do look very different. But obviously, the um, the essentially the operating deficit that we're seeing is funded completely by the department. Yeah. Um, but their funding no longer sh is shown as income in the accounts, but instead goes through reserves, which is why it looks a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a very conscious decision that we had to, because as we're no longer a trading fund, our accounting treatments have to change as well. Okay, I think the uh, annual report also uh, has a sort of a, a good section around uh, our governance statement, around our performance, and also about the achievements during the year. So I, I think actually it gives a really, from my perspective, a really balanced perspective of all the things the agency does, which is yeah, in itself quite a, an, an achievement. Um, just before we ask the board to approve this, June, is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of, because obviously once the board's approved it, you need to sign these as the accounting officer for the agency. Well, I would just like to repeat that this year's annual report and account set a new standard, Chair, that we need to emulate going forward, a standard of the quality and the timeliness. Yeah. And I think that really has raised the game of the agency to be able to do this. And I would like to thank you for the way you've driven that. Well, I think it's been a team effort, I think, is the, is the reality. There's, I think there's lots of people being involved in this. So, uh, But uh, Paul, uh, you had a, a question? Yeah, I mean, it was just a bit, it was a general comment, really building on what you've just said, June, there, um, that it is a, it's a good report and it's the transparency and the bar raising really important. Because when I was reading through um, tackling inequalities, increasing patient engagement, successfully delivering transformation, performance targets met, this was a 2019 report. Um, I was sort of looking back on, and then I thought this is quite interesting. So I went back to 2017, five-year digital transformation portfolio plan been in development over the last two years. And then 2016 health inequality targets um, uh, that were being proposed, 2010 strengthening of pharmacovigilance, um, BROMI, better regulation of medicines initiative to decrease regulatory burden, then 2005 was interesting because it was a report on the safety of SSRIs, which we had last year. So it was sort of um, just interesting sort of looking back mm. and sort of maybe sort of an opportunity before you depart, Chair, to um, reflect on your time. But then also wondering, actually, what could we learn by um, sort of segueing into the later science strategies, almost like a history yeah. analysis that needs to be done by an MPhil or somebody to just look at the learnings over mm. Um, a much longer period. Yeah, so that, 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 that's a really interesting perspective. You know, there's, there's there's no doubt that things have changed enormously in in in, in the time. The agency was effectively twenty years old this year, established in in two thousand and three. 
So, uh, and it's something we didn't particularly mark because we were so so busy in, in, in the doing the doing. But I think uh, a, a lot has changed over that time, Paul, and uh, interesting perspective. Mm. I think, uh, you know, June, you, you, you've been through, uh, you'll remember all of those things, I would imagine. <laughs> There were some old photographs of June, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, young photographs young of photographs. June, please. <laughs> no, exactly. So I, I think I'd also, one of my reflections as well, this will be the first time in my eight years on the board that the board has been able to approve the financial accounts at a board meeting uh, without having to delegate that authority to the chair of the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee. So again, I think a particular congratulations to uh, you know, the finance team and the governance team for enabling that to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, it, 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 it sounds easy. It really has not been a, in, an easy process. It is a fundamental document that we need to uh, approve. And on that basis, that's why we wanted to do that. So I think we should record uh, our very sincere thanks as a board to the entire team that's been involved in putting this together. So that being the case, now is the moment of truth. So can I ask if the board is content to approve the uh, annual report and financial accounts as have been circulated to us separately? I'm seeing nods, unanimous nods around the table. So uh, formally then, uh, let's approve and endorse the draft annual report and accounts. Uh, we can advise uh, the chief executive, that's June, to sign the accounts and then submit them to uh, the National Audit Office uh, for the Comptroller and Auditor General for his approval. And Michael already said that will be on Friday. And then they can be uh, laid in both Houses of Parliament ahead of the summer recess to meet our statutory conditions. So I think that feels like quite an important achievement. So thank you to everyone who's been involved in that. So that brings us back uh, from the history to the here and now. And so if we can move on, please, um, onto page number 23. Um, let's start with a reflection, I think, in terms of what's the most important current activities and priorities from the chief executive's point of view. So that's the current activities. So June, uh, you can assume we've read it, but any key points you'd like to bring to our attention? Well, yes, Chair, and thank you for that um, introduction. The report, as ever, demonstrates the breadth of activities, the challenge, and uh, clearly how busy the agency is. But I think there are three key themes perhaps to have in mind as we look at the specific items of achievement. The first is patience and the public. The second is our partnerships. And thirdly, people. Our people, as ever, are what this makes this an organisation that achieves everything that's in this report. Uh, we launched the corporate plan last week and maintaining public trust is our very first priority. I think that says a very great deal, Chair, from where I sit to yeah. where the agency has come, given those reflections on that long journey. And I think there are a number of ways just to have in mind the increased transparency and openness, our commitment to perhaps delivering public hearings around uh, important safety issues, our aim to improve really involve patients and the public in all of our activities. Some great examples of where assessors have been listening to lived experiences, for example, the uh, people with sickle disease who've been advising in relation to the assessment of a gene therapy. And then in relation to one of the issues that we have been thinking about very hard for a while, Valproate, the fact that there have been important stakeholder engagement exercises recently to help us be much more assured that new risk management will work. And of course, you knew that there was a big public health program about adrenaline auto injectors, again, based on listening to families and their experiences. So a huge amount around patients and the public. I think the second theme is partnership working, and I know we'll return to that later today. Uh, we've just returned from the very first get together under our chairmanship of Australia, Canada, Singapore and Switzerland to demonstrate that broader partnership at international level to accelerate innovative products coming through to patients here. And we've been looking at the Windsor framework as a way to make sure that the whole of the UK benefits from this step forward in licensing medicines for the UK. Uh, not forgetting the work on medical devices with the industry driving that ongoing work to ensure that medical devices for the health service are available. The CE mark should have uh, finished at the end of last month, but now we're continuing. So huge amount, breadth of activity, all in partnership. But I think the most important flavour, I would say, of this report is our people. 
the fourth pillar of our corporate plan, a place to have a great career where people flourish in their roles alongside a customer service uh, environment. And I think that that really will be the theme going forward. I think as we look to be a properly focused service organization, these are the things that will deliver um, new ways of working that we want to build on following our transformation. So public trust, partnerships, and our people. But Chair, before I finish, I think there is one aspect of people that we really want to pause and reflect on at this moment, because it is your last meeting as Chair, and it hasn't come up in a conversation so far, and it can't go much further without our reflections. You have led the agency through a period of absolutely unprecedented change from that long, slow evolution we've just talked about. And you've made this board the focus for the strategic direction of the agency, a clear vision and a corporate plan that will take us to the destination we want to reach. I think you've done this with great skill and commitment, quite a bit of push and pull, and later today, we'll have the chance perhaps to talk about that with each other and with our partners. But the key point, and one that really needs stating, is that the agency is now in a sound and stable position to go forward. We have just signed our annual report, or approved our annual report and accounts. We've got a clear vision in front of us, and it's all thanks, Chair, to your strong leadership. So I think we can only say in very simple terms, thank you from us all. Well, thank you, June. Um, I might make some comments at the end, if that's OK, uh, about, about myself. But uh, I, th I think what I don't want to lose uh, is the real opportunity we have here with, with the agency. There, there is so much going on and, and there's so many good things going on. And it's a real team effort. So, you know, I may have played a small part in that. Um, but the reality is it, 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 it's all dependent on the 1,200 people that work for the agency and, and do a, a fantastic job every day. And I think actually, June, your report really shows the breadth uh, of the things the agency is involved in. So again, thank you for articulating that so well. So if we can put me to one side for the moment, please, um, <laughs> and, and then just focus on the agency, which is really the, yeah, the, the, the main task of, uh, of, of this board. Um, but can I ask if there are any immediate questions for June on, on this report? Mandy. Thanks, Stephen. And I would echo the, the breadth of, of uh, activity that's go, going on across the agency. Um, my question is, there's a lot of really good aspects in each of the areas. So in patient engagement, um, where we've had meetings with, um, with patients and, um, and charity groups, we've got education outreach. How are we bringing that together, particularly that communication and education, both to um, internal in the agency, but also um, dissemination of best practice so that each group doesn't need to go out and do the same thing, but we're sharing that? Because I, I think that will help accelerate the things in our corporate plan, particularly around putting patients at the heart of everything we do, but also that that learning around how we get better regulation. Yeah. June, June? Well, this is a really, really important consideration. And I think you've described the challenge beautifully. How do we meet that challenge? I think, Stephen, your legacy that this is one agency, that we work according to the product life cycle, and that gives us a clear pathway to envisage how we benefit from the input that patients and the public give us. There is a lot to do to bring people into that space. But what we see is, a, if you like, a sea change in expecting someone else to do this, to the ownership, as we've said, with the assessors thinking, I'm going to license this important new product or bring along this development program or look at this safety decision. And I will do it better if patients and the public are integrated into the work that I do. But there's a lot more to do. We don't turn a tank around overnight. And I'm really pleased to see that the work of the patient and engagement group and the committee that assures the board is really flourishing. With every piece of work, we see that coming together that you've described. But Chair, it could be the, the subject of a seminar yeah. and a lot more thinking, but to make our corporate plan take us to where we want to be, these are the thoughts that will help us mm -hmm. get there. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Graham, did you want to have a question? 
Separate question, actually, but um, to pick up on the sort of aspects of service that you were talking about. So first of all, is um, just to ask about the main priority that you've listed there and, and whether there's any update on the progress of eliminating backlogs and um, the timelines for that. Do we want to pick that up in the I hope segment? we'll go into more detail, but really to nail that the priority is absolutely where you've um, articulated it. After careful thought back in April, we gave a series of commitments mm -hmm and those will be met. September the 1st for clinical trials backlog. Uh, I think there's a date in November for the updates to licenses, but the really important date alongside that is January for applications for new medicines that are compliant. So all of this is in hand, and I think we'll look at more detail in subsequent discussions. Yeah, great. I think if we can come back to that, Graham, in the performance report, because I think there's some specific points I'm keen to progress on that. So the, so the second question was just related to 5.1. So I was interested that you were talking about broad customer insight mm -hmm. projects and the service. So um, there wasn't much detail in there. I wonder if there were any lessons that you would want to share from that. Customer insight. The, so, yeah. yeah uh, I think we're, we're getting much more geared into the fact that various opportunities exist within the agency. One is our customer experience center to feed into our prioritization. Um, in a number of ways, we're beginning to settle that into a systematic review of customer experience. But I think it's not a case of sitting passively. We need to go out and seek that experience, but um, very much uh, the way of informing our priorities. Yeah, maybe I could bring Rachel into the conversation if I can, just specifically around the customer insights work, because there's, there's a lot going on, Rachel, in this area. And we had our you know, patient public involvement strategy. It's been going now for a couple of years. So, you know, in, in answer to Graham's question around, you know, what have we learned from the insights that we've gathered so far and, and what difference has it made? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the question, Graham. Um, so on uh, the specific pieces of insight work that are mentioned in um, Chief Exec's report, um, there's a number of pieces that we've done uh, over the last few months, uh, ranging from specific customer insight to patient insight to um, our uh, work on the help, on how we uh, involve and better communicate uh, safety messages to healthcare professionals. And where we are at the moment is bringing those different reports together into a consolidated set of um, points that we will then want to feed through to the board. So uh, there are some there are some very specific, some of which are. Uh, you know, immediately actionable around how we um, how we respond to inquiries, the priority that we give to correspondence, the um, way we handle uh, freedom of information requests. Others are uh, rather longer term. So the ones that can be actioned quickly, we're taking forward now. Um, the broader themes we will bring back to the board. Yeah, and I'd, I'd encourage that to be the case because obviously, as June mentioned, the corporate plan priorities, you know, maintaining public trust through proactive uh, and innovative communications is critical to this. So I would expect uh, this to be a sort of a continuing feature because we need to use the insight to then actually, what are we going to do about it and how are we going to proactively communicate with all our different stakeholder groups? But you want to come back on that, Rachel? Yes, yeah, so I was just going to add, Chairman, that um, we are now uh, almost two years into our patient involvement yeah. strategy, which was a very ambitious four-year strategy. So we're just developing plans for a mid-term um, evaluation. Patient Safety and Engagement Committee have given us some early thoughts on yeah. that and we'll be um, carrying out that evaluation over the autumn and winter period so that we can then look at whether there are any adjustments we need to make and any refresh of the uh, the strategy that's needed. Yeah. So that's that's very much a live piece of insight work as well. And it links with the Cumberledge work as well, which we'll Indeed. come on to later in terms of, uh, be, again, being very open and transparent about how and when we make decisions. So that's important. OK, Mercy, I think you want to ask a question. Well, it's more just an observation and encouragement. So uh, and it kind of links into yeah. what people have been talking about as well, uh, which um, I noted the um, Health Service Journal Patient Safety Award um, and the publication in Nature. So I think uh, when we go for these things and kind of benchmark um, um, outside the agency, it's really important because it, it shows uh, that we're kind of uh, developing, you know, good standards, um, that we're being judged in, you know, um, externally as well. So I would kind of encourage staff to keep doing that. Um, and uh, well done, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Michael. 
Um, yeah, I've just got one question. Um, paragraph 6.1, where you note the very good progress in moving towards international recognition. Is that fully operational now? Is that the way the agency is, is regulating in, in, in some respects, or is that coming later? And, and the second point relating to that is that will have some resource consequences. I think the idea is that we will redeploy staff to areas of, of particular interest for the U UK, if that's the best way of putting it. But I just wondered, June, where are we on that and what is the timeline? The timeline in a nutshell is end of the year, which is when we switch from the ability to rely on EU decisions to international. But we're not losing any time on this because we can learn from that experience and make sure that our international reliance recognition pathways are mature. It's what I've been discussing with Australia, Canada, Singapore and Switzerland, particularly so that uh, in the future, mutuality it can be part of this. But all the work being done should result in redeployment of resource, and we're very much looking forward to doing that. We want our talented staff to have really rewarding roles and the scientific challenges that they're here to feel fulfilled by, and uh, that will be part of the strategy that the executive is uh, putting forward. And I, I guess it's also part of the challenge the Chancellor of the Exchequer set us in the spring, spring, spring statement, you know, to have the, you know, the fastest, most agile uh, and responsive regulatory system in the world. So, yeah, that's got to be the ambition. So international recognition is part of that, but it can't be the only part because I think there's still a need to have in-depth scientific expertise in other areas. Um, I'll come to Paul and then I'll come to Raj and then back to Mandy. Uh, I mean, so building on uh, earlier comments and it's just delighted to see the school's outreach. I think that's great. Um, and with moving to Zoom, yeah. um, it means that we could potentially sort of reach any part of the country, which yeah. I encourage us to do. Um, and I sort of see that as part of really sort of patient engagement in a broader sense. And myself, Junaid and Graham, as part of one of our appraisals, which we have every year, it's sort of quite structured in, um, in medicine's appraisals. And one of the section is around your educational roles and sort of prompting you to reflect. And it may be that you don't do anything, which doesn't matter. And I'm just sort of just wondering whether um, that might be part of at least sort of certain members of staff at MHRA, part of their uh, annual appraisal, just to make a sort of prompt to think about this external engagement work. Well, that's an interesting idea. That really is interesting. And clearly we need to create scope, space, right environment for that to be done. It really is extremely rewarding, but also important. Mm -hmm. And I think if the think about the education that uh, kids go through around personal and social mm -hmm. development, taking care of the medicines that you use or the devices that are needed really can be part of that to encourage mm -hmm. that uh, to and fro that we want to see because the public patients, whatever their age, are a key part of how we deliver. Yeah, is, is there an action there, June, do you think, actually, just to you know, just follow, follow that one through in terms of you know, working with the uh, one agency leadership group to think, is there a bigger role we could play in, in, in education? Yeah. Uh, I'm absolutely happy to. I think we've already had good experience, as I say, with uh, around vigilance, yellow card, personal and social development. Yeah. Let's revisit that and look at proposals that might be a bit wider than vigilance. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, Raj, do you have a point you want to bring in? Can you just press the button, please? Um, it's still in the it somewhat builds on what Paul said on the educational subject, more on the international perspective. June, I, I, I would also like to highlight just the wideness of the scope yeah. of work the agency does it just ranges uh, massively and a reflection I think on the skill sets that's available within the agency that's further reflected I think in when we get asked to go to GTPH you know you've named a few things like the global training hub for biomanufacturing the NOPV discussions this this really puts the agency very much on the international front but it also has the educational aspect of it. The reason why I am assuming being invited is that, that there is a skill set and the expertise within the agency that they are looking for. So my your thoughts on this, is there an opportunity? Clearly these are targeted, some of them are for LMICs, uh, low middle income countries. And the global training hub itself was an outcome of the WHO mRNA vaccine hub that they they're, they're trying to build across to, to enable vaccine uh, mRNA capability for vaccine manufacturing, is it still a new technology? My question is, is there something we can do here, given all this expertise for the UK, 
where we can bring not working solo, but working with some of our other partners, uh, you know, and coming together and doing something similar like the GTHB, right? Because the expertise is here, but taking maybe even to the next level for manufacturers of vaccines who are interested in, in working in the UK. I just think you have this expertise within the agency, clearly called upon internationally, right? Is it time for us to say, can we harness that and bring it back to the UK front, working with other partners in the UK? Because there, as we know, there is considerable interest in vaccine manufacturing now in the UK. And maybe sometimes, you know, the if the stars line up, <laughs> the opportunity, yeah. the impact of the opportunity is massive. Yeah. So just food for thought, you know, around. Yeah, June, do you want oh, to respond to really that? Bring Glenn in as well. Theme around making things um, come together systematically rather than taking mm -hmm. ad hoc opportunities, and it is remarkable how the kind of quality, skills, experience that the agency has, coupled with innovative can-do thinking, are, if you like really needed in certain environments. So on a specific around vaccine manufacturing in low and middle income countries, we're certainly in that space. But I think it's good, I think, to perhaps build on what you're putting forward to look at it systematically because the public health here is part of global public health. Yeah. So as uh, Tedros said at the WHO in COVID, no one is safe till everyone's safe. And I do think we should take that context. This is not off-piece skiing. Mm. This is actually about public health for the UK as well as internationally. Yeah. And, and, and Glenn, how, how can we maybe use some of our expertise to drive some of the partnerships that you and your team are working on? I mean, the approach we, we pretty much always take is, John, is find out where the capability and capacity lies in the agency and if there is a a partnership on the table on the uk side of things we're already engaging i think through laura's team actually on the manufacturing side with yeah. ukri and innovate uk um it, it's a balance between how much of this can we take on yes. and how much we have to do as day-to-day -day working so um we do have a group uh, across the agency it's an informal partnership partnerships group um that raise this kind of issue what would you like to do how can we yeah. help you get there and then vice versa so there's a mechanism to capture it if we need to um a lot of the conversations we have at the moment that are international and global health there's a lot of requests for, for time for, for agency staff but i do take raj's point and there's a lot we can do internally and what's the point of engaging with the with the recent nurse review and um, why should you have the agency in the, in the room day one when you're building a facility well yeah. here we go so uh, there, there are conversations we've had in the uk as well mm. yeah no, I, I think it's a, i think it's an interesting perspective and i've always been struck by uh, you know your motto of uh, partnerships with a purpose yeah you know and it's making sure that purpose actually provides you know uh, uses our expertise but also we can support the uk and and also strengthen our international partnerships and i think there's they seem like the two big wins for me don't they which is exactly what your team are working on so okay uh, mandy you had a point yeah, and I think it, it builds on quite a lot of what's what's already been said in terms of are we putting enough focus on our education role in its broadest sense? So if you look, say, at international recognition, are we educating industry well enough so that license applications are good quality when they come to us, which will have an impact on backlogs and things like that? Are we also educating um, at school level and at, at university level to make people understand more about regulation um, and even with you know maybe with uh, funders in terms of you know when you think about biotech startups and that innovation thing a lot of people don't have a clue about regulation mm -hmm. and I think in terms of that for laying that foundation I think some of what you can't do everything as Glenn said but how we got enough emphasis in our planning around what are the key partnerships and what are the key pieces of education and training which will have that impact um, yeah easier and, and I, th I think they're just, just I'm just checking in here now in terms of the uh, the corporate plan which we've approved you know and I think you know picking up in year one uh, for maintaining public trust increase extending outreach to patients is one of our key objectives uh, if we look at then uh, in on enabling healthcare access to safe and effective products developing and embedding system cooperation with your partner organizations um, then scientific and regulatory excellence through strategic partnerships uh, and, and then I think actually using you know, the MHRA science strategy as part of the way to drive some of that one through so I think we've got all the component parts within the corporate plan actually which is really reassuring. 
we just need to do it. Okay. <laughs> I think that's the point. So, but that, that's helpful. Let, Laura, you want to come in? Yes, I was just going to make one further point about education. And uh, a, a couple of boards ago, I think that might have been the last board, we talked about the compliance strategy. Yeah. And the heart of that is that the, the first thing you do to try and get compliance is education. Um, so that's that that is at that, the heart of that. So we try and get it right upstream rather than checking it afterwards. Yeah. Um, but I think also in, in terms of, of medical devices in particular, as we think about the um, the uh, regulations for that. Software and AI is a particular area of yeah. education because one of the issues that we have there is people recognizing that what they have is a medical device. Um, so I think I think there are patches of it, but I think you, you're right, Andy, about thinking about that as a sort of strategic approach. Yeah. So it feels like we've got the framework though within the corporate plan to build and 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 and, and deliver actions on those particular components. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? I just had one observation as well. I, I think, you know, June, I always like reading your report because it's so comprehensive and it shows all the fantastic work that we're doing on innovation, access and safety, uh, the international work, the partnership work. And we've talked a lot in these boards about people as well. But something that we haven't talked a lot about uh, you know, through your report is actually the area of digital and technology. Uh, and, and I've got to say that in this month's report, particularly, uh, there's some really significant steps forward with our digital and technology agenda. And I just wanted to call that one out because I think, Claire, you and your team are really involved in some quite significant programs of work at the moment that will enable this agency to fulfill its strategic potential so I just, I, I, that was just my observation because we haven't in a previous report had a lot on digital and technology but i thought there was a you know in section four some quite significant programs so i just wanted to note that actually but uh, thank you to claire and her team for helping to enable the agency because it only works if it all works back to the pedros yeah. point in a way yeah. so uh, that was that was my only other observation mm -hmm. OK, so that being the case, then, I think we're asked to uh, note this report and, and in particular, the five priorities on, on page number 31, June, that you've identified, uh, maintaining the focus on delivering core business functions. We'll come on to performance in a moment, leading the development of a new reformed med tech regulatory framework, uh, refreshing the innovative licensing and access path pathway, refocusing the regulatory management system program and strengthening the visibility and accessibility of agency leadership. So that feels like the... Uh, the absolute package of activities for the near future for the next six months effectively okay so if we can on that basis note june's report with huge thanks to everyone in the agency uh, who is actually all supporting this this is not just about june it's about the 1200 odd people who work for the mhra on, on a daily basis so thank you for that that leads us on to uh, the next item which is then around the operational performance uh, which i think we, and, and some of the financial performance as well uh, and this is again current performance up to the 31st of may um, so rose you can assume that we've uh, read the report but are there any particular key points you'd like to draw to the board's attention please thank you yes on the finance side of things i think at this stage of the year because it's month two it's still very difficult to see trends in the financial data but uh, I think it is clear to us that uh, we need to review some of our budget profiles because many of the variances you're seeing in the numbers are the result of incorrect profiling. Mm -hmm. So uh, the team is going to be working with the business over the next couple of weeks as we do our quarter one profiling. Um, and they're going to look at that profiling as well to ensure that um, we, we improve it a little bit. Yeah. Although I would, I would argue that you've got the previous 12 months. And so there is a sort of a profile yes. based on that too. So I agree. Yeah. And, uh, I think there's definitely lessons learned to take away in terms of our budget, yeah. how we how we profile that budget from, from the beginning. Yes, I agree. Okay. So what, what, what I suggest that we do, can I suggest that we take uh, financial questions first, then we uh, uh, ask some questions around clinical trial performance, and then some questions around established medicine performance and, and, then, and then anything on the people aspects as well. So if we just do it systematically, it'll save us shooting all over the place if, if, if colleagues are happy with that. So in terms of the financial performance, uh, Rose has sort of given the, uh, you know, the health warning, if you like, uh, on, on, on its only second month data. But are there any specific questions or comments around the financial performance of the agency at month two? Michael. I'd expect you to ask Sorry, something. Just, um, I would agree with all that Rose is saying about the, the profiling. I suppose the one area, Rose, and we talked about that slightly concerns me is capital spend. 
Um, and, you know, given that we're no longer a trading fund, we don't have that flexibility. So making sure that we make good use of that money in year is so important. And um, I just wondered how confident you feel about capital spend. Yeah, just just building on that, I had the same question, Rose, as well, which was, you know, again, ultimately, why are you so assured yeah. that we will spend the budget this yeah, year when our history yeah. has not supported that and we've not achieved our capital budgets? What's going to be different this year? Thank you. That's a quite a challenging question. Um, so uh, in terms of the capital budget, the variances you are seeing are partly because we have profiled it based on plans back in February, uh, and those have shifted. So a lot of the variances you are seeing are because the profile has now shifted um, in terms of our plans. The thing that gives me assurance that we are going to spend it, certainly on the, um, there's two things I would say. One is that on the six million we have set aside for South Works at South Mims, we have a very, very clear um, uh, line of projects that we are implementing. And it's the strongest I've seen it since I've been here. I know that's not a long period on which to reflect, but certainly it feels a far more robust plan in terms of delivery. And we've built in potential delivery delays due to um, uh, lead times with contractors and also um, thought about what we would backfill if those contractors could not implement in year. So that gives me some confidence. Um, on the other side of things, we have actually essentially over-programmed yeah. our capital so that um, we uh, will, there is that pressure during the year so that when, if things slip to the right, we do have uh, projects that will be able to spend the capital. And what percentage is that over-programming? So uh, it's around 10% uh, over programming okay. at the moment, uh, but we have to manage it on a on a obviously on yeah. a monthly basis to ensure that we land. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Uh, my only follow up to that is, and I really support what you're doing, Rose. Is is the percentage of capital spend that you're anticipating in the last quarter of the financial year? That's my biggest worry. You know, and you'll know from your professional experience. <laughs> Most organised, most. I would be very surprised if a really good finance director didn't say what you're saying now. <laughs> but then you get, you get to November, yes. and it looks like. And so that's that thing. Does the profile show what percentage of the capital budget is going to be spent in the last quarter of the financial year? I'm so, sorry, it's a yeah, very no. It's a very good question, and we are we are actually looking at it again as part of the quarter two, quarter one. Sorry, uh, forecasting. We're looking at that profile again because yeah. actually we don't we know it needs to be changed. Yeah. So I can't answer that question at the moment, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. but, but I think they're the classic, yeah. they're the classic they comp components, aren't yeah. they, to good capital management. You know, you over-program, and at least by 10%, mm -hmm. I would argue, and, and also you reduce as much as you can the final spend planned in the last quarter, uh, because other, otherwise there's a risk of not achieving. Okay. Um, Hader, I think you had a question. Yeah. Um, Rose, this may not be a question. Um, just for you, but I, I was really pleased to see the impact um, that CPRD was having in uh, June's report um, uh, across the board, and then surprised to see the, the reduction um, listed in this report in the income budget for CPRD. So I was just wondering, um, I was just curious to, to know if, um, what the background to that was and how we might mitigate that in the future. Okay, Rose, are you able to shed some light on this? So not the details, I'm afraid. So if, if you don't mind, I will come back to you on the details yeah. later. But okay. uh, I know that we did a deep dive on a lot of our income to make sure, just following the budget, that we were robust about the forecast for, for, for income. So that was one of the areas where we decided to be a bit more conservative in our expectations for income. But I'll come back to you with okay. a bit more detail. As, as, as if by luck, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, Alison Cave and also Dr. Janaid Bajwa have also been able to join us uh, in, in, in the last sort of few moments. Uh, so after their you know, various delays and, and personal appointments. But uh, Alison, as, as the executive responsible for CPRD, is there any assurance you can provide, Hader, on, on, on the income and, and what we're doing in that area? Yes, absolutely. It is just a phasing issue um, of some of the major licences, which as they renew through, they come up at different times. There's been a bit of delaying on the contracting side because of some complications with those contracts. So we have every confidence that they will come through later in the year. 
Okay. Great. Um, Raj. Thank you, Chair. Um, Rose, oh, collapsed on me. Um, Rose, firstly, congratulations on the reduction of the customer debt. Uh, that's been on the board's discussion for on a few occasions. So it's nice to see you've made a significant that in, in terms of getting money back from our customers for fees for services that we offer. Having learned from this, Rose, is, do, you, do you have any insight on how we mitigate this for the future? Because it was a significant amount of money that was owed to the agency. Um, have we, are there, is there anything we can do for the future? Thank you, Raj. Um, so to be honest, this is as much about our own internal processes and systems mm. um, and ensuring those work effectively. So we are resting a lot of hope on RMS. Yeah. Um, and ensuring that that has much better processes for uh, recording income and ensuring that our debt data is good quality. Um, so that should make a lot of difference going forwards because at the moment we are using a lot of quite old systems mm. uh, that we have inherited from previous organisations. Um, and so bringing them all together in one will make a huge difference. Yeah. Which is not just about the regulatory, it's about the finance, you know, to pick up, collect the money. Exactly. As my first sales director once told me, a sale is not over till you've got the money. Exactly. And, and, and I think it's, it, it applies to us too. The other thing we are doing, and I think is, is critical and has made a huge difference, is that um, building relationships with the right people in the organisations as well. So that, um, and, and helping using our operational leads as well around the business to help leverage those relationships. So that we talk to the right people in the organizations as well okay thank you for that all right i think might be a good time to move on to um clinical trials performance and uh, as is as is the norm uh, we published our um, may data on the 16th of june or 15th of june sorry uh, and obviously we'll be publishing our june data on the 15th of july so we haven't uh, got any sort of uh, you know validated data yet but i think Rose, I specifically asked you to add into the report on paragraphs 4.6, 4.7 and 4.8, just if you like an up-to-date version of what's happening on clinical trials performance. And, and, and Mark, I'm just wondering whether uh, you know, your team obviously involved in this, you could maybe just comment on how are we doing in terms of improving our clinical trials assessment? Thank you very much, Chair. So first thing I'd like to say with clinical trials is that it is a vital part of the health uh, life sciences infrastructure for the UK. But our perspective is driven by ensuring the safety of the patient and the participant. So in uh, dealing with the issues in clinical trials, we ensure that everything we do, make sure that the patient retains that safety. Now that said, we've um, been uh, uh, working through a comprehensive set of changes. Um, we've been dealing primarily with recruitment, and we've now got the recruitment up to the uh, level. And that's the recruitment of staff. That is the recruitment of staff. Yeah. Sorry for my ambiguity. Recruitment of staff yeah. into the clinical trials assessment team. And that can be seen in the May figures that we have now um, hit our uh, previous performance targets in terms of ass assessment of trials. In now, first in man, not, first not in, on all first in man, but also in some of the amendments and other mm -hmm. sectors. So um, we're now uh, uh, turning our attention to the delayed uh, applications, where we have been working very much on process improvement, yeah. and we've seen significant uh, changes in pro uh, improvement. These now then need to be communicated with stakeholders so that people understand fully what that means. And that's uh, well, communication will continue, and we are aiming, as June said earlier, to meet the 1st of September target for controlling this. Yeah, and, and how confident are you that we'll be able to return to normal statutory guidelines from the 1st of September? Oh, very. Very okay. Well, I think that's yeah, that, 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 that's excellent, Mark. You know, I think I think in the May report we saw on the fifteenth of June, yeah, you know, there was a few green shoots. Mm. So, am I right to assume that when we look at the fifteenth of July publication of our June results, there will be a more visible difference in some of the graphs? I should hope so. I haven't seen the data myself, but that's what I've seen from the informal data. Okay. Um, Graham, yeah, I think you were asking a question earlier about uh, clinical trials performance. Does that assure you? And anything else you well, want to explore I further? Can't ask for more than the answer. Very, Mark. So thank you. <laughs> um, no, no, that's great, and it'd be, it'd be great to see that data. Can I just 
clarify what you're saying about the communication. So if I understand correctly, you've made some processes, particularly on the minor amendments and revisions. And I assume that, that you're implementing those and then communicating them, or are you trying to socialize that first? Um, it will be a combination because the changes we've made uh, so far don't require significant changes by the applicant, which we're doing to basically ensure consistency, but we would still need to put out guidance on what what it is we're doing and what changes people might see. Okay. And, and, and Rachel, could I just bring you in again for a moment, please, just in terms of the Customer Experience Centre, he's probably handling an increased level of inquiries about what you know, what, when are we going to get my clinical trial approved? Uh, how are we coping with that demand? Yeah, certainly. So we have seen an increased number of inquiries over the last few months, exactly as you, you've you said. Uh, that has decreased slightly over the last few weeks in line with the um, improvements that Mark has highlighted. And what we've done is we flexed our resources to put additional staff into that area so that we can handle the inquiries that are coming through. Yeah, and um, how, also how that, working very closely with Mark's assessment yeah, How does that team. practically work? Because obviously we want assessors to be assessing the applications. We don't want them to be answering a query to tell them it'll be another two weeks but how, how does the communication between your teams work yeah indeed so um we have very extensive um uh, guidance that my team can use to answer um uh, you know many many of the questions and then we would only go to mark's expert team if there is something that cannot be answered within the customer experience yeah. center so the whole aim is to um handle inquiries within customer experience to keep mark's team um able to focus on the assessments okay. but it's a very close partnership yeah. and mark you want to add to that um, just to reassure our sponsors of trials that, of course, there is a dialogue within the trial application around the technical detail, and we're maintaining that as well as these inquiries Rachel's just discussed. Good. OK. And June, I know that you're very concerned about this, and I know you've been thinking about resource requirements across the agency. Is there anything else you want to add in terms of uh, you know the way we're dealing with this, uh, you know, reducing the backlogs? It is our top priority operationally. We realise how important it is to get this right, to get the date of the 1st of September met, and we're moving resource both from safety and surveillance and from healthcare quality and access to be sure that we meet that date. Yeah, so there's a, so, so what I've heard is a recruitment of new staff, there's a, a readjustment of resource, there's close working with our communications colleagues, there's transparent performance measurements, uh, and, and actually we've got some new risk proportionate processes, which we also think will help to speed up the process as well. So there's a whole series of actions that we're doing in this area to improve our performance. Is that is that a fair summary? That's a very good summary, Chair. Okay, and, and, and Claire, do you want to add something? Only a quick one from me. So digital and technology are doing their little bits. So we can't provide medical assessors, but we're, we've prioritised with our other priorities, RMS being one, um, what we can do from a tech perspective yeah. on the report in the admin side as well. So right. that's from this week. So this feels like a team effort. So certainly as a, as, as a, as a non-executive, that gives me quite a lot of assurance from different sources. So... Uh, Colleagues, any any further questions, uh, Mandy? Yeah, I'm just thinking about reputation really here because I think we have got a bit of a reputation that it's quicker to go to Spain than it is to come to the UK. How are we actually getting the message out that we have got this under control and there's data too? Because I think there has been a little bit of a dip in confidence mm. out in the um, industry and in research establishments. Yeah. So I think we need to think really carefully about our communications. Yeah. And then again, the, the data on the website is, is a, a key part of that. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think, think we've got to think about that. I, I think starting to think about that's good. I think we need to demonstrate that we are delivering on the timescales before we start talking too much about it. Uh, I think delivery is critical in this, I, I would argue. But Rachel, any thoughts on how we can think about rebuilding reputation? Yes, absolutely. And it's something we're we're very much uh, working on at the moment. Um, I think it does come down to confidence that we are meeting the timescales we have published. So uh, you will have noticed that when the um, statistics are published every month on the website, there is also some accompanying narrative. And we're using that to indicate where improvements have been made and the, the trajectory and then sharing that widely as appropriate. Yeah. But I think the, you know, what it all comes back to is uh, the confidence that can be given by seeing the improvements in the figures. 
Yeah, you see, and I, and I think this fits really neatly, neatly again. Sorry to keep uh, talking about the corporate plan, but building trust, it was intended for public trust. But I think we need to build stakeholder trust through proactive uh, and innovative communications. And I think part of that is not just simply being you know, putting something on the website. It needs to be actually how does that fit in with all of our partnership work? How does that fit in with all of our stakeholder meetings? Because we need to be thinking of every avenue where when we've actually got this back under control, we can actually actively communicate that through every avenue possible. Because if we don't do that, we know that industry is already talking to ministers uh, at every opportunity that they can. And, and so we need to actually have some balance in this discussion, I think. Okay, uh, Junaid. Thank you. Just, maybe just to, to um, chime in a bit more. So I think the points you made are probably some very helpful, key, uh, almost common communication things that we have to communicate from this meeting. And every month when we meet, there's probably another set of common communication bits. So I think, is there something around, as we think of our stakeholders and leveraging groups like the ABPI or equivalent MRC and others, that we make a proactive step to actually go out and engage above and beyond what's on the website? And the, and the second question I had was just on resourcing. How far away are we from having the appropriate resource? Are we there today or will we be there a month from now? in order to deliver against the ask. Okay, my, Mark? In terms of resourcing, we're there today, but there's a training um, because of course there's experience. So we're do, uh, we've uh, put in a new training program and we're uh, putting in various levels of mentoring as well to get everything up to speed. So I'd say it's more on training than recruitment at this point. Um, in terms of engagement, we have uh, regular approaches with the ABPI and other trade associations. And yes, we will be engaging with them, but we want to have a very clear message because of course, they're just a uh, basically a vehicle for reaching the wider stakeholders. So, and there are multiple other vehicles. So, we just need to make sure that that we're reaching all of the stakeholders, not just a particular trade association. Yeah. And Mark, if I may, just how long does training take? So, at um, what point are people trained up and ready to start actually working on the? It doesn't have a full accreditation as yet, which is something very interesting for us mm. to look at for the long term. Uh, effectively, we do it by. Uh, affect training and then seeing the rate of errors by having an expert review it. It depends a little with the individual, but also on the complexity of the trial. I'm not sure I have an absolute yeah. figure to give you. Yeah. I know we haven't got the absolute granular data, but paragraph 3.4, Junaid, uh, shows uh, science research and innovation headcount. Uh, we've got a 10% vacancy rate, which actually relative to pretty normal organizational standards, I would say is, uh, is pretty much a normal headcount. So that feels the right place. Obviously, we haven't got this split between clinical trials and, uh, and research and development and so forth and, and batch release, but uh, it feels like we've got staff in the agency. Uh, and I think accelerating the training is, is, is clearly a, a key component to that. Okay. So that, I think, gives us a sort of a state of the nation as far as clinical trials is concerned. Could we maybe just do the same uh, exercise, please, on uh, marketing authorization and established medicines? So, again, uh, you know, Laura's team have helpfully added in paragraphs 4.12 to 4.17 on pages 40 and 41, just to talk around uh, the, pro the latest progress before the, uh, the June data is released on the 15th of July uh, in terms of um, you know, what's happening on established medicine performance. Laura, is there any, any sort of points you'd like to raise for the board's attention on the way you're dealing with that? Yes, I would. I mean, this has been quite a long tail going right back to November last year when yeah. we recognised that um, we needed to fill our vacancies, but we also needed to tackle the issue of the quality of, of, of applications that came in. We set up a task and finish group with industry and we've worked with them all the way through. So that has been a, a, a dialogue since then. We've now um, filled our vacancies in established medicines. We are also trying to get people um, operational more quickly. The full training still takes time, but that doesn't mean that they, they can't be productive earlier in that time. And I am very pleased now and very grateful for the, to the team, to what we're starting to see coming through as green shoots. 
One thing I would want to emphasize, we talked about clinical trials being a team effort. This is also a team effort, particularly across HQNA. Whilst established medicines performance is in um, population health, um, we require the support of medics in innovative medicines and a huge amount of support as well from compliance and, and uh, data quality in authorization life cycle. So there is a lot of cross team working in here. The first commitment that we made um, for performance has been met, and that is referred in 4.14, which is that we will be handling variations within statutory timeframes from the 1st of July 2023. So I'm really, really pleased that our, our emerging June data shows that we are doing that. There is a tail on that, um, and so we need to make sure that we clear that tail. In, in that respect, we've continued with education, in educational events with industry to try to help them to understand what makes a, a good application. We have a further what we're calling a clinic on the 19th of July, which is where rather than us talk, um, we've asked in, uh, invited uh, in trade associations to bring in questions so we can it can start to be a bit more of an interactive thing. We're really getting into the detail of that. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is clearly um, the performance on initials, which we need to be back up to performance by the 1st of January, and really pleased to see the emerging data from June, 60 marketing authorizations on new generic medicines granted in June, and that's 38% up on May. And you will also see when the data comes up that that figure that I've been really interested in, which is the time to first RFI, uh, we're sustaining our performance on that. It, it dropped in, it was low in April, it was low in May, and it's still low in June. So um, I really want to thank the team. Um, you talked about ownership of the problem. They absolutely are owning the problem. I would like to make sure that in HQ&A, we don't forget to also own the celebration. Yes. That's not to be smug. No, That's I not agree. to say we've done it. We've got an awful lot of work still to do, and we're continuing to do that. And the BGMA will shortly be publishing their latest performance survey, and we will be at their regulatory group talking about that. This isn't a job done, mm. but we are reaching some good mind milestones. And I really want to thank my team and Julian Beach, the deputy director, and Andrea Johnson as well, and yeah. uh, Shirley Hopper for the work that they're doing uh, to bring this forward on all of their teams. Yeah. You see, I think this context is really helpful because I think this is, this gives really strong assurance that we are definitely dealing with the issues. You know, I think the transparency of the pub and publication of the performance data, the May data showed there was definite signs of improvement. You know, and I think what you you know what your comments here have uh, have helped, Laura, is is to identify there's further improvements that look like they're visible. We'll see that transparently on the fifteenth of uh, July when uh, you know the June date is published. Uh, but this is clearly uh, demonstrating improvement from my perspective. So thank you again from from me. But colleagues, uh, have any specific questions anyone wants to raise uh, as far as that's concerned? No. So again, I'm really, really pleased to see the uh, yeah the the strength and operation of the work, and again the transparency of being able to share how we're doing in real time. I think is really impressive. So thank you for that, uh, and keep up the good work. I think also the engagement with industry has been particularly strong in this area, Laura. Yes, and I think I think that's been very helpful as well. It's 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 allowed um, an open conversation yeah. uh, about things where we can we can it's it's our issue, but there are there are shared yeah. solutions for it. So uh, that has been extremely helpful. So I again I'm 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 grateful to, for trade associations for their positive engagement on that. Yeah, perfect. Okay, well thank you for that. Okay, um, so um, I did promise that we'd also just uh, just come back to people as well, just to finish the performance report. Um, so again, we've got some uh, some people statistics. Again, I think we've got to note the significant improvement uh, in terms of recruitment. Uh, you know, the the fact that we we're down to you know around about so 10, 11 percent vacancy rate in total across the agency. There's obviously differenti uh, differentiation there between different groups, but I think actually we've got transparency of data. Uh, we can see where we're at. I understand completely. There's a need to still train people, but you know, I think I think we need the people in place first <laughs> you know so uh, you know that feels quite really good progress from my perspective but were there any th thoughts or questions around the people aspect of the report mandy i just noted that 
digital and technology still have quite a high vacancy uh, level and given we've got these key projects such as RMS I didn't know whether Claire wanted to comment or whether there was help needed in that area I think it's not unique to you Claire is it in in, in MHRA digital and technology but uh, any perspectives it, it's just an interview, public sector yeah. and private sector DDAT so digital data and technology roles um, are really hard to fill we have been recruiting on average one a week so you can't see that in the figures so it's improved significantly and just restricted really some of the things that I've talked about last year about location for example so we only recruit um, in London and South Mims area so there are there are lots of things that contribute um, but still working hard um, to address that and like I say on average one new recruit per week. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a work in progress, though, I mm. think, isn't it? And I think it will always be, if I'm being honest, because yeah. like you pointed out, MHRA is no different We're not alone. to comparable organisations and in private sector. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay, um, June, can I just ask you for any sort of final reflections on the performance report or anything else you'd like to, that hasn't been covered that you'd like to mention? I think it's really helpful that the board is totally engaged and focused and helping us to grip this, because it is the number one at this moment for confidence that we can deliver the public the service, the industry the service, ministers' confidence, and so on. Yeah. So we've got a way to go yet, but let's keep relentless yeah. focus on that. Yeah. But, but Paul? Um, it's just a reflection, actually, on Claire's comment, um, that thinking about the um, organisations in Canary Wharf who don't have the salary restrictions, which we do in the private, uh, in the private sector, and they really struggle to recruit and they just can't compete with the the finance yeah. financial sector so um what they are doing is looking overseas um well both outside of london but also overseas mm. they've just been forced to so we do have some offshoring so overseas for some of our projects um but not permanent staff yeah. um so we can outsource for projects but permanent staff has all sorts of security right. and tax implications yeah. etc we've now got good performance reporting and, and and so rose i know it's not just you but your team have helped to pull this together i think again in my eight years on the board i think we're finally getting performance reports that we can actually understand that are really transparent and are really quite pointy in terms of what the issues for improvement and the issues that have been achieved so again i think this is the level of reporting i think an effective board needs so thank you to you and your team for your support on that and so I think on that basis, we should probably note this report with thanks and to uh, you know, please keep up the good work uh, to achieve the public commitments we've made. And I think the key action probably from that discussion is could I maybe suggest that uh, the next board, there should probably be a, a proposal in terms of what's the proactive communications and engagement uh, required to maintain the trust of our industry and research customers. It feels like... Because by the, by September we should therefore, you know, Mark's very confident uh, assessments on clinical trials being back on track. Uh, that would feel the right time to be starting to actively and proactively engage our customers, not just communicate with them. If we take that as an action, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So that moves us on in terms of the next key item, uh, which is again something that's been in the works for a while, and that's. Um, um, what are the strategic priorities in the AMHRA science strategy to enable the faster access of safe and innovative products to patients in the UK? Um, so this is on page number 44. Glenn, you've actually helpfully uh, pulled together a, a short paper. Do you want to make some introductory comments? You can assume we've read it. Sure. Uh, this is uh, working with colleagues across the agency over the last uh, few weeks to get this get this to the board uh, the document itself the strategy document itself is fairly high level it walks through our foundations in science and research and then looks forward uh, about a ways to deepen that science base the evidence base that we can operate on uh, builds very much from the corporate plan the yeah. priorities in the corporate plan um, and, and other sections of this document pull from that that document as well as you would expect as it should sit beneath it um, the areas in there are, there's some detail on the areas of, of scientific priority as well as cross-cutting areas for uh, for future work and how we build out from where we are now but yeah very much look forward to the conversation okay well thank you for that and, and i think it does build very nicely on the corporate plan but it also uh, you know pulls together all the other 
regulatory reform agendas, uh, you know, through you know, McLean and uh, O'Shaughnessy reviews and so forth as well. Uh, but Mark, you, you and your team have been also intimately involved in the development of this for some time. Is there anything else you want to add to the board's attention? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who has been involved. It's been a real team effort. Um, a large number of scientists have engaged through workshops and document reviews and, and discussions over the past um, few months. I'd also like to thank the um, NEDs and the board members who also contributed a lot of thinking in the um, uh, over the past month just to make sure that we really have got a well-rounded view. And I'd like to say just how excited I am. This is a very um, strong document. It makes a very clear statement of the agency science, um, possibly the clearest it's been. It highlights clear areas for us to develop. Um, it really does emphasize where we fit in. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to point out some of the new areas that we're particularly prioritizing. It states very closely that we're engaging with the patient on the science. This is uh, an evolving area in terms of how can science research um, uh, engage. It's something which I think we can improve dramatically. Um, it also highlights uh, just how important collaboration and partnerships are. Uh, it has an international impact. And uh, finally, it introduces some new areas, such as looking at the effect of policy and how that affects what we do as regulator, and also sustainability, looking at net zero. So okay. thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So, so I think this document really sort of uh, articulates the strategic intent. I think that's probably the way I would sort of almost summarise this. But uh, colleagues, any particular comments or questions that people want to add? Graham? Um, well, I mean, it's great to see the document. And um, I think just to echo... I think in in the process, it's been great to see cross organizational working. I think it does reflect that, and I'd really encourage that to be further nurtured as this develops. I think it's acknowledged that this is going to develop further. Um, I see that you know, there's a plan for a scientific advisory board to meet in the first year, and I'd encourage that to be earlier. And obviously, if that can include expertise um, relevant to these key areas, that will be helpful in shaping this as it goes forward. Um, and so, yeah, no, I think it's very positive. I suppose my question might be, uh, based on this, what won't be happening uh, and what are the sort of things that are not being done? I think with this, it's very clear what the new priority areas are, which is great. And are there things that will be deprioritized as a consequence? OK, maybe start with Glenn from a policy point of view and then maybe to Mark from a practical point of view. Policy point of view, really, it depends on where you, what, what you start at the moment. There's a lot of pressure on the regulator board. It's not just on the program we we talk about trials as well, most of our trials are being I think there's a, a need to prioritize for the bigger emerging areas, so we have to give a to maintain the um, And so we'll, we'll need to look at the team my team about how we put ourselves against those resources and then how we put across the agency as well. So from a policy perspective, though, um, the science areas are all emerging because they're tricky. Oh, Glenn. The trick is how do we do this through partnerships and collaborations because we are a finite number of people. Um, so where we can't do it internally, then the conversation will have to shift to how do we leverage the RNI system in the UK, and I would argue beyond. Yeah, yeah, I think that's going to be quite crucial. And again, that was why we quite deliberately wrote that as uh, a scientific excellence through strategic partnerships in the corporate plan. But uh, Graham, do you want to come back on that, and then I'll come to Mark. Mark. It's always a challenge to decide where to stop science. What needs to be remembered is that the science that we do all evolved uh, with some public health support. So we've been talking about putting into a mechanism to ensure that we are actually, is it still supporting public health? And we've been looking at that in terms of case by case. Over the past year, we've been particularly looking at, um, say, the standards portfolio, where we've worked out that the uh, reference materials we make are no longer developing a function so uh, supporting a function so they can be discontinued so um and then we've built up that case there's going to be a constant challenge in terms of balancing resource with public health impact um it's very important that we build that review it's something that i'm hoping that scientific advisory board will work on and will advise the exec and the board on what should and shouldn't be stopped yeah you see, we've got five very clear scientific priority areas of uh, vaccines and immunotherapies, biotherapeutics, cell and gene therapies, diagnostics and genomics, data science and AI and software as a medical device. I think I would have thought the starting point is to look at every single research project we're doing and then seeing does it fit one of those five priorities. And then I think you need to think about what's the change control process 
to then justify why that work should continue. Because unless you do it in a structured, systematic way, we just carry on doing what we've always done. And I'm not sure that's really interesting. That won't happen overnight. But I think you've, my advice is you've got to be quite deliberate and you, and, and you need to create a process to sort of say, you know, why are we carrying on with that work when it's not in any linkage with the five priorities? But uh, Graham, is that anything you've done in the universities uh, or any, any other experience you could bring to bear on that? No, I'm not sure I can bring specific experience that's relevant to this. But I mean, I think you're right in the sense that it's not necessarily that anything has to stop immediately or, or change. But I think you need to be purposeful about the things that are happening. And I think probably most things that are happening align very well. Yes. And that could be mapped on. Do. It's just we don't. But really, we don't know that. We don't know that. So I think the more visibility we have of that, the more confident we can yeah. be that it's it's aligned. OK, that's yeah. be like practical action. But Raj, do you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, slightly different perspective here, both in the context of the science strategy as well as the multilateral partnerships, because they come together, I think, quite a bit in terms of because we, our science strategy cannot be unilateral just to MHRA. We have to work with others. So hence why I'm bringing these together. I think that during the course of the of several board meetings, we've had lots of new ideas uh, and opportunities. And very often we look at that and we say we don't have the resource to do it, you know, at this point. You know, it's a fine tension. I fully appreciate between what you have and what we need to do. I wonder very much in line with what you just said, Chair, whether there, we need to come up with a mechanism whereby these are collected and documented and on a periodic basis, maybe once every four months or something like that, we get a 10 minute look to say, this is what we put up as opportunities that we, you know, we could work on. This is what we prioritized four months ago. Uh, is it still makes sense to leave this as opportunities for the future? Or to your point, I think public health impact can change very quickly. And it just gives us all collectively a chance to see what is meaningful at that point mm. and enable the board as a collective to, you know, to make suggestions to say, maybe we should change course here, you know, change tack. The reality is we're not going to be able to do that too often because a lot of our delivery is mid to long term. But it, that exercise alone makes you step back and look at it strategically to say, does anything even need to change at this yeah. point? in terms of what we're doing. My concern for suggest, my, my reason for suggesting that is, I think some of these ideas are really fantastic ideas. They get lost yeah. because we don't bring it back. Mm. And I think particularly in this area, because science innovation just change, you know, has the potential to change and partnerships can also change over a period of time, is to bring that together. And whether that's a mechanism the board will find useful to have just 10 minutes, just looking at it uh, and then tabling it and actioning it to say no action needed or we need to do something here let's bring it back to the board you know yeah. six weeks or so. you see i would have thought the um the, the mechanism probably most suits that is probably the the regular reporting of where we are with the corporate plan which we've typically in the past done on a quarterly basis you know that that might be an opportunity just to sort of check that we're on on track and and, and actually do any adjustments need to be made but that's just a suggestion no, I think that's one piece. There's two pieces need to come in here. One is, I think the corporate plan check is probably the right area because that's our trajectory yeah. you know, in terms of. The other piece is these innovative ideas and suggestions that yeah. are coming through. They need to be put in one place, I yeah. think, so that we compare the two. Otherwise, you're just looking at the corporate yeah. plan in isolation, you know, to see, because I'm guessing at some point that might be one or two nuggets yeah. <laughs> in there that you would yeah. think at the time you've progressed to, that it'll be very opportunistic to actually pull that in and, yeah. and maybe get a bigger bang. It's, yeah. it's a, you know, having that broader strategic. Yeah. But I think it's doing it at the same time, right? As a corp, sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Doing it at the yeah, same time. Yeah, at the time. same time as a corporate plan. Be be because actually, we've got, otherwise, there's always a risk. We, we rush off down a particular avenue after a whizzy new idea yes. and we aren't yeah. true to our yeah. strategy. Yeah. And, and, and so I think actually, it's, it's, it's a good idea, I think, to review the initiatives but they have to be aligned, I think, to the direction yeah. that we go. No, totally agree. But collecting and co keeping those ideas somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's, one no, no, two, no, exactly. it's one or two ideas. I think, you know? I, I think, I think it's I just think. good to have it so that we just visually also, met, you know. Helpful suggestion. Uh, Janae, I don't know you want to come in and also Mandy. So I really welcome this and it's really, really helpful to see. My question would be, this is kind of a three-year strategy and I think it's highly ambitious and I love the ambition. 
within the ambition, where do we really feel that we will add disproportionate global impact in these areas? Because um, I'm not sure it will be all of them. And I think in some of them, we're starting from a position of strength. But there are others where we probably need to have very nascent capability building and skills capability building and indeed talent coming into the organization to help us achieve some of these goals and ambitions. And I wondered if you'd had any thoughts on that and linked to that, how can we truly leverage the ecosystem in the UK, the academic ecosystem, the BRCs and others to supercharge our specific value add to deliver against the science uh, opportunity yeah. here? Because I don't think we can do it in isolation. Okay. Uh, Glenn, what's going to have the most disproportionate global impact? Brilliant <laughs> question, Janae. <laughs> Better check that investment portfolio now. I'm not sure I know the answer to which one will be most impactful. Um, it's hard to predict that. I would just challenge the need to do it in every area, in every area, because there are, at least in my view, and happy to debate the issue. Um, we can be excellent in one or two yeah. and need to know a lot about the other three uh, to be able to do our regulatory job very well. It doesn't mean we have to lead the world in those areas. We have to be around the table, we have to be in the room. Um, but whether or not we take true global leadership positions is, I, I guess, like Mix River Raj's previous comment, how do we balance off where we are? Yeah. Um, I mean, those areas are areas that are picked because they are impactful and emerging areas of innovation. Um, I don't, there aren't many organizations, the like US FDA is very large, maybe they can do it that to cover off every single yeah. area of, of science. But um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a challenge for but, us to do. But that. of those five areas, Glenn, where do you think we, what, what's our real strength, you think, of those five key priority areas? Well, we already have uh, vaccines and immunotherapies, and we're, we're right on the edge of that. Um, and that's just that's yeah. partly coming out of the, of the of COVID pandemic. And, and actually, the maintenance of that through Mark's work and his team is to keep us there as well. Uh, and we're working very much from policy, from the UK ecosystem perspective and internationally in yeah. that space. That's somewhere we can't we can't lose that position. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would I would argue uh, very strong in, in biotherapeutics. I think diagnostics and genomics, because of the UK ecosystem, would be another area where we should push hard. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure we've got welcome partnerships out there already that love to come work with us on that. And, and you've seen that already with Genomics England yes. and, and, the, and the Biobank. So those 2.5 areas, the vaccines, the immunotherapies, the, the diagnostic genomics, and then the biotherapeutics and so on. Yeah, so okay, that's helpful. Uh, June, have you got a perspective? Think well, of I your do, research? and I think it's really interesting because we like lists and we make a list of five, but I think what we do especially well is bring things together, and that's the opportunity when AI helps to combat AMR, when the basic science on neurodegenerative disease helps us with uh, dementia, and the particular aspects um, that, that biomarkers are needed. And I think if we pick our issues, it's the ability to bring things together in the UK ecosystem. Sorry to sound vague, but when it works, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, that uh, in a sense, so let's not see these as let's rank them and let's keep them in separate buckets, separate teams. Let's make sure with every idea that comes forward, we bring the cross fertilization mm -hmm. because it is AI and diagnostics as has been surfaced. Yeah. It's AI and uh, where we are with AMR. Yeah. It's the neurodegenerative basic research into tau protein that is happening down at South Mims that will help us solve uh, dementia and the biomarkers that are needed and that enables a whole field to move forward i think it's the unique opportunity is that cross-disciplinary cross-specialism working yeah that's, that's really, i think that goes a long way to answer today's yeah. question and, and, and i think also uh, we've got unique assets yeah. that other regulators just don't have so actually bringing that together but mark mm -hmm. i know you want to come back in uh, I just want to strongly support what both um, Glenn and June have said and just point out that our new structure, the product life cycle, is causing quite a change. By bringing everybody together in a new way, we begin to see that end-to-end -end regulatory process and it's already firing off new ideas. So I think that will emphasise really the work where the MHRA is unique and where we can make a unique contribution. Great. Okay. Mandy, I think you had a point. Yes, I think it's it's building on all those, and there's a lot here. And I think this is, I think it's really helpful to pull into those five priorities. But I think Raj and you said there was something about some of our processes now yeah. um, to actually make this reality, and I think that's going to be really important for us. And so it's the it's almost now the mechanism. What's the next stage to make this reality? And I think that would be really helpful for the board to see. Um, and understand where we're making those trade-offs and priorities. 
you know, whether it's sustaining our current capability in vaccines and immunotherapies, whether it's taking an opportunity, mm. say in neurogenitive. So we then see how we fund that, how we get the skills and people, because otherwise it will remain on paper yeah. as a wish list. Mm. And I think we've got, you know, such a strength to bring that forward. But it's going to need some nitty gritty process yeah. to bring that forward into reality. Yeah. And I think I'd like to see where, you know, is it by the end of this year that we'll have some of those those things okay. to to flag wave about to some yeah. and then excite our staff mm. to to work with. So I think in terms of the next steps, Glenn, I think there's an intention to do some further engagement um, um, as well. So do you want to describe what you've got in mind? So we've already started, really, um, from the court plan to this plan. I was just going to come back to, to the comments about how do you, what the process might be. <clears throat> the, the good thing about strategy documents, in terms of what, what we do in partnerships, is it allow us to actually start to lock down a few areas and look at the opportunity cost of going this way or that way. We spent um, certainly the last year or so in my group foundation building who we're talking to in our profile raised this allows us to go down some avenues but you're right when we find a dead end we need to come back and say actually that's not that's not going to work for us so there's a quite a bit of work to put in place and certainly around the Circes and the conversation we're having with other parts of government is where's the return on investment where's the impact in areas of science innovation and what can the UK do so starting to do that now already where would you look where does the agency more usefully engage um, but I completely take that there needs to be a process prioritization what we're doing specifically we do we we so we, we're talking to what search funds for quite a while um, and talking now for broader sector my recruitment has now nearly completed I have one vacancy at the moment yeah. um, so we can deploy that that national partnerships team more more readily into the yeah. community as they right here we are how can we work with you um, and also building on the capabilities in South Mims okay yeah and, and 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 how long is it going to be before we can maybe see some outputs from all the engagement so i'll probably take away an action for the day if i can invent one for myself uh, on the five areas and the cross-cutting themes and do some specific pieces of work with round table exercises etc yeah. to find get some answers um they they're not the quickest to set up but yeah. i would say four to six months before we can come back with some initial yeah. findings uh, you see man mentioned the end of the year end of the year and that feels like sort of a, a, a sensible uh you know p uh, time to scale to work to and it sort of complements other plans I think we've got as well so uh, okay Mark did you want to come in because I want to keep to just to add to that um there is the international perspective so for instance at the moment today we're um hosting the WHO influenza strain selection committee and so that kind of work will follow an international timetable which we want to incorporate yeah. fully into this um uh, and then, of course, there are things like implementing the O'Shaughnessy Review and the McLean Review, which were also are bearing on, on this particular strategy. So, yes, very happy to come back at the end of the year, but there will be some intermediate reporting. Yeah. OK, that's great. Uh, Mercy, final question from you. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's really um, a kind of a suggestion. Um, I agree with Graham um, about the scientific advisory board, depending on what they do, of course, <laughs> um, but having them sooner rather than later. And then look at good um, practice for lay involvement, mm -hmm. because I think that could really help um, support um, the development of this strategy, um, which is very ambitious, I, I think so as well. And also... Um, using capability and capacity all the way through it it definitely builds up on um at least the mclean recommendations and stuff and how important that is to to uh actually kind of develop some of those systems of of getting good talented people yeah. into the agency okay great well thank you for that um, i'm just conscious of time so i i, th I think uh, there's been a strong suggestion of scientific advisory board sooner rather than later, including lay involvement, as, as Mercy says. I think there is a need for our existing R&D portfolio to do a systematic review to ensure its alignment uh, you know, with the five strategic priority areas and then to make a conscious decision of whether to continue or not. Uh, and, and that conscious decision will be multifactorial, but largely based around public health impact. I think then, you know, I think the engagement uh, that, that Glenn, you were just describing there, needs to continue. And I think then a sort of a formal re report back to the board, say, at the end of the year. Because I think we need to allow sufficient time for the, you know, to, to get some feedback before we debate that one again. But I think unless there's anything else, I'd like to you know, commend the report uh, and, and, and thank everyone who's been involved in putting this together. Uh, it gives us a clear strategic direction for our science strategy. And, uh, yeah, let's crack on. I think is how I would describe it. So it's good. So thank you very much.
Okay, on that basis, uh, if we could then move on to uh, a little bit of a retrospective look now. And uh, Alison, thank you for uh, being able to, to get here this morning. Um, just in terms of the Cumberledge Review, three years ago, just over, uh, 8th of July, it was published in 2020. Um, we've done an enormous amount of work and, and you've, you've put together a very helpful report which describes all the actions and process things that we've done in that last three years to really address the concerns raised by Julie, you know, Baroness Julia Cumberledge. Um, you can assume that we've read this report, but any key points you'd like to bring to the board's attention, Alison? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity because I think it presents the actions of Bill Implement across the whole agency. So yeah. not just my group, but across the whole agency to try and address the recommendations of the Cumbridge Review. Um, uh, we know we still have a lot to do, but I think three years on, it does provide um, really the key activities that have taken place. So, for example, the change in culture and governance, including establishment of people and culture committee, the patient safety and engagement committee, as well as a program of staff and a new code of, of practice activities to increase patient engagement and involvement in our work across the whole product life cycle. And that's supported by a patient involvement strategy launched in September 21. I think critical to the main recommendation of Baroness Cumberledge was a major investment program to upgrade our safety reporting systems. And the board has heard around that um, a number of times over the last two years. And that's really beginning now to reach fruition. Um, as well as other activities around strengthening our decision making. And, and also very importantly, um, continued work to strengthen the regulatory framework for both medicines and medical devices, which is ongoing. Um, but I suppose we really want to emphasize that this isn't a job done. We're going to continue to listen, to learn, to fully deliver on the commitments. And I think our new corporate plan brings out some new further activities, including work on transparency, transparency of safety signals, but also the benefit, the basis of some benefit risk decision in Laura's areas, increasing the diversity of patient engagement, really incredibly important across all demographics. We want to pilot public hearings on major safety issues. And obviously we're continuing to refine and improve our vigilance approaches. And one example of that is the launch of the yellow card by a bank. So thank you, Chair. Very happy to take any questions. Well, th thank you, uh, Alison, to you and everyone else who's been involved in doing this. But June, any reflections from you, bear in mind, I know you gave evidence uh, on behalf of the MHRA to the Cumberland Review while it was uh, going through the uh, review stage. Uh, any observations or reflections from you? Simply just support what Alison said. We've made great strides and all with the lens of listening to patients. And that has been the touchstone yeah. of listening and learning and incorporating patients in our safety work. Um, the technical infrastructure, as we've recognised earlier on, is vital to that sense of dialogue rather than a black box where people send their important experiences. So building on that, but there are some more things to attend to. And as Alison has said, the work isn't finished yet, but we keep striving to get that, that balance right of access and safety. OK, uh, and, and, and Mercy, uh, as our chair of our Patient Safety and Engagement Committee, I'm sure you have a perspective on this. Um, I certainly do. Uh, so it's been uh, really useful to look over three years because it's also been three years of the Patient Engagement and Safety uh, Committee. So it's good for us to reflect as well. Um, I'm, I'm glad to report that everything in this report is regularly reported to PSEC. And we, we often see things sometimes at an early stage, but also at as they're developing and, and the patient involvement strategy is one of them and I'm going to comment on that a little bit um, later on in, in my report. Um, so it, it's been uh, good to look at those things. Um, there, there's still things that um, would be great when they're when they kind of come into fruition, like the unique identifier stuff um, for devices, I realise that we we really need to work with other partners like NHS Digital um, uh, as well. So it's not um, just reliant on us, but it's like, how do we push that? How do we make sure we're fully engaged with that? Um, but it was uh, really good to see things like Yellow Card in the NHS app. Uh, my challenge would be that the person on the streets really doesn't know what a Yellow Card is still um and they they 
don't you know kind of necessarily know what um adverse reactions that, and who they should be reporting that to um they might go to their doctor they might not so i think even though we've done quite a lot of communication on this and certainly through the vaccines um i think there's still a lot more to be done on that so that would be my challenge to the the agency um and my my question really is um about our work with patient safety commissioner uh and the, the work they're doing because that that's yeah. you know a key thing of cumberledge um then they're now in post um and uh we are working with them so uh really as alison particular has a, a close relationship or or is is working and meeting more with the the patient safety commissioner what are they finding is are there changes that are that are going on and and uh, what are the key things that the patient safety commissioner might be challenging us back on yeah. um that would be really useful to know okay uh, Alison so what's Henrietta telling us so I continue to have a good working relationship with uh, Dr. Hughes. Um, we meet monthly and we also collaborate by email. She's obviously uh, looking at some of our key priorities as well, including sodium valparate um, and continuing to listen to patients yeah. around other issues. So we do work closely with her. One of, I've got a meeting next week, actually, with her. So, um, yeah, very similar priorities around listening to patients, access yeah. to care, that those sort of um, concerns that we are also hear a lot about. I suppose importantly, do, does the Patient Safety Commissioner see that we've made progress? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's also um, obviously very interested in data yes. as well. So we're talking to her about registries, about work to to use digital approaches to better manage risk mitigation they're very interested in those approaches and how we can use you know clinically real world data as such to understand better patient experiences but also patient access to some of the measures that we're putting in place through the regulatory system and how they're actually yeah. working i think it just demonstrates we can't do this in isolation and, and, and glenn nhs is clearly one of the uh, key stakeholders in this and uh, you know the way we build our relationships you know not just in terms of innovation but specific, you know, particularly on the safety is there any other perspective from you of how we can extend our working relationship with nhs england so we have a quick pretty good one with certain parts of it it's a yeah. bit of a big organization a also very big um, organization not we can't restrict ourselves to NHSE and no, the UK, of course we can UK because of Scotland, Northern um, Ireland, and Wales. So the work we're doing uh, in my group with that alignment piece and getting as many people in the room as we can on the topic of access at the moment, um, but we'll also broaden out to safety and innovation. Um, it's not a fast process. It's uh, no. not every, there aren't actually common people on all of these topics in the, in in the NHS bodies organisations, but we're doing what we can on that front and trying to do, uh, build the relationships. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Okay. Um, colleagues, Graham. I mean, first of all, I just wanted to reflect on how much is in here. I mean, it's three years is not that long and there's a huge amount of, of real change in there. And I think that was great to see pulled together because I think we're aware of it. But we don't often look at it in one go. Um, my question was really to pick up on, on something that Mercy touched on. And I think one of the things that seemed positive in there was about the yellow card reporting and the bump from COVID vaccines. And that that seems to have led to a little bit of a legacy of increase, both in, well, particularly in terms of healthcare reporting, I think you said. And I wasn't clear whether it was also patient reporting. So I think my question was really about your ambition for that and how much you know about awareness of yellow card, particularly in the public and, and where you want to get to, because it feels like the processes are now with the technology coming in, you'll, you'll be able to deal with more um, and, and how far you want to get to in terms of awareness and, and engagement from the public in terms of reporting. So what would success look like then, Alison? Well, I would just um, reflect that we are continually working on that. We have a med safety app. We work through our yellow card centers to continually try and promote. I agree that there's still awareness is much lower than we would want. I actually want to increase both patient and healthcare professional yeah, reporting. Because if actually you look at the statistics, we get more reports from patients than we do from healthcare professionals. So I think both elements we need to work hard on to try and increase awareness and facilitate the ease of reporting and i do hope with the safety connect platform we that that has facilitated 
um, and then more easy reporting, such as auto-filled reporting forms, you know, and we've actually just launched a new accounts mm. area where people can launch account, build and, and register with us, where we can now start to get that two-way exchange. But I think it's 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 all of these, no one yeah. single approach. We have to have multi-pronged approaches in order to increase that awareness. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I and agree there's still work to do. I don't know what I would... I hate to hang a target on it, yeah. but you know, I would. I think it'll be a continuous priority. Yes, uh, Alice. I don't think you'll ever you'll ever finish that at one but, level um, because it continues to show its value. Yeah, it does. But but I'm just interested in terms of uh, we have a secondary care clinician and a primary care clinician sat next to you. Um, yeah. So so how can we improve uh, increase the level of reporting from uh, healthcare professionals in the secondary care environment, Paul? And then I'll ask the same question to Junaid in primary care. Yeah, I mean, I was just sort of reflecting when you were speaking there that a lot of the drug issues that I see in clinical practice um, are, are not reported because I, I think clinicians don't perceive them as an MHRA issue. Um, so the, the medicine is sort of not performing as it says on the tin. It's, sort of, it's an expected effect. Um, but they're just being... The, it, it's either, either sort of perceived as already known or they're being used in incorrectly right. and who do you report that to because i think a good example would be the opiates um we knew as the neurologists that this is that there's a big problem here mm. is that an mhra thing is it a cqc there's not an, mm. there's not a mechanism to actually use the report to cqc or gmc really it's a, in an appropriate way we would certainly welcome those sort of reports as well as reports used according to their indication because then at least we can then start to work yeah. with our communities to understand the basis for that so we welcome say all reports, all reports. on all medicines and all devices yeah. okay so i think that's the case and there's a major piece of education that needs to be undertaken with clinicians yeah on on, on that basis yeah. okay there's maybe a little bit of self-limitation that's getting in the way but uh Janaid, from a primary care perspective so I think remembering that primary care is multidisciplinary, it's yeah, not it just GPs, and we have a, quite a wide skill mix within primary care. And I think that could be a huge asset when I think about upskilling pharmacists, AH, uh, and other allied health professionals, PAs, nurses, and others. So where a adverse drug event is reported and how it's reported, I think it needs a, a multidisciplinary approach. But the PCNs, the primary care networks, I think are a golden opportunity for us to engage and think about how we encourage them to then communicate with patients in an effective easy manner around how to best report things either through a self-service situation or indeed through that primary care wider ecosystem i think will be important so primary care network engagement i think is probably going to be really really important for us okay. and cqc again i think could be a massive enabler yeah and, and, and we have partnerships in, in in those areas as well don't we of course so okay um any other thoughts comments or reflections on this report uh, michael i really struck on what um struck by what mercy said and also graham and you know previous boards going back when i first joined a couple of years ago we were very much focused on um how can i put it market penetration of the mhra brand how well the general public understand because i think you have to be careful about is it what do you want them to be aware of you want them to be aware of the yellow card or do you want them to be aware of mhra mm. i think you want both mm -hmm. uh and I've, i'm not sure chair that we've looked at this recently and i wonder if we do i know you've i think rachel you've commissioned work uh to look at you know what impact we have out there but i think it might be timely to return to yep. this you know in, in the next Six I think months. on the board agenda we've got we've got a, okay. we've, we've got an item on um, a communication strategy. But uh, Rachel, do you want to make any initial comments to that? Well, yes, just to say um, now that we have the new corporate plan, we will be uh, we are developing um, a communications and reputation strategy update, which will come through to the board um, on your specific point about um, brand penetration and market awareness. Some of the um, insight work I mentioned earlier does include that so that we will bring that through to the board. I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but it's certainly in the, the suite of work we've done over the last couple of months. So, but but I think I think there's an item to come to the board uh, later this year, actually, Michael. So on 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 communications. Okay. So, if there's no other questions, can I just just again uh, reiterate thanks uh, not just to you, Alison, and, and and your team because it is it is very much as an agency wide effort. Um, but I think this report is phenomenal. 
uh, I'll be honest with you. And 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 uh, when Baroness Cumberledge first issued her, uh, her findings, you know, I think it was a time of quite significant reflection for us as an agency for those of us that were here at the time and, and it was quite a significant moment um, and I think actually the this is the best of the agency we've responded with positivity proactivity and we've actually really made I think a genuine difference to the way that we're approaching regulation in this space and and yes there's still work to do and there frankly always will be on some of these items um, but I think this is a tremendous accolade to uh, you know the the work of this agency over the last three years in this particular area and uh, I, I still think it would be a good idea to invite Baroness Cumberledge to a board meeting at some point in the future uh, to be able to take her through this uh, you know line by line because I, th I think she deserves that but I'll just leave that as a, a thought uh, for, for, for the future um, but again if we can note this report with thanks I think that would be excellent Okay, so thank you very much for that. So that just leads us on to um, a final assurance report from the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee. Mercy, it's page 72. Uh, you can assume the board has read it, but any key points you want to bring to our attention? Well, it's um, very apt to have this after the Cambridge uh, review You'd think report. someone thought about the agenda, wouldn't you? <laughs> how this works out um so only a, a, a few things for me it's been really interesting i think um first of all to reflect that we're at our 10th meeting mm -hmm. um over the three years because um and it has been uh quite a lot of uh, work so uh, i want to um really thank um committee members who put a lot of time uh and effort into um, thinking about what we do, but it was a good time to really pause and think um, about our forward plan and what we want to take um, forward. First of all, um, you know, the, the sort of topics that come up regularly for us, um, so that could be things like Safety Connect, CPRD, um, ILAP, all those kind of issues come up regularly because we want to know what progress is yeah. being made. Um, but also like what what was missing um, as well. So we we did have um, kind of a good debate on that. Um, I think we've we have got a, a forward agenda, a forward plan now. It's it's open um, to revision because as Raj was mentioning in in earlier comments, things do change, and we have to keep an eye on on um, developments within the agency. And we want to be as comprehensive as possible I think in in PSEC uh, so just to say that we had that debate um, the um, other comment I would make on the evaluation of the patient and public involvement strategy uh, and that was really good to to actually discuss how we want it to be evaluated so we really approved a framework uh, of evaluation on it um, because the other thing I'm really keen for our, our committee to do is look at our impact you know what difference uh, does it make um, over time and, and one of the key um, strategies that we did approve uh, as the board approved was the patient and public involvement strategy uh, so we really did have uh, quite a debate about um, how we evaluate uh, and um, because I think when we come back um, and we talk about the difference that strategy has made we want to, to make sure uh, that that we gather the right kind of evidence uh, to look at that impact um, and just the the other uh, key area just to assure people that we always keep a um, keep an eye on what what um, you know the issues were within Cumberledge is that sodium valparate also came back um, uh, to the committee so that we could see what was happening um, uh, at the moment around um, prescribing around yeah. sodium valparate uh, and the difficulties and the issues uh, that might be, including how uh, patients uh, feed back to the, uh, the agency as well and through um, the uh, Commission for Human Medicines too. Uh, so uh, just to assure the board, uh, we looked at all those kind of um, issues and um, I think really had a good debate. And, uh, and again, I want to uh, thank the committee for their their honesty and um really you know having open debates which we do um on these issues uh so uh yeah so i'm happy to take any questions and of course um both uh, the non-exec and the exec committee members are here so they can also yeah, comment. You spread the load i can see okay so colleagues i think a, a very clear report there and thanks for the extra explanation any particular comments or observations that anyone wants to raise No, I think actually 
I think it's, oh, oh sorry, Jim. Certainly want to support everything Mercy said. This is a really important focal point for being held to account for the assurances that the board requires in this vital area. And looking back over the 10 meetings, it is amazing how it has evolved and gelled. So much more energy now to tackle some of the opportunities risk benefit communication, uh, the usefulness of a patient leaflet, just to name two. And I think in that way, we can absolutely maximise the, the corporate plan uh, delivery. So thank you. Good. OK, well, thank you. On that basis, then, why don't we note that report with our great thanks and thanks to uh, the team for all the work they've done on that. So that brings us to the end of the substantive agenda, um, but I did promise at the very beginning there would be an opportunity uh, for members of the public to ask any specific questions related to uh, today's agenda. So Rachel, as our uh, yeah, Director of Communications, uh, do we have any questions that members of the public have asked that are relevant to today's agenda? Yeah, so we've got two questions uh, that have come in um, today. Uh, so the first one uh, relates to the clinical trial discussion uh, earlier. It has been partly answered, but there's a second part to the question. Okay. So uh, the questioner was asking the board to clarify when review times would comply with the law for clinical trial approvals, and that's 60 days. And when will the agency return to competitive timing for trial approvals of 14 to 21 days? OK, Mark, I know you partly covered some of this earlier, but do you want to answer that question specifically? Um, just to um, reiterate the um, deadline of 1st of September that we mentioned earlier in, in the debate on the wider discussion of the competitive time frame. Uh, this is actually part of the O'Shaughnessy review recommendations that um, is looking for uh, particularly to meet the 60 days time frame in the first instance. And um, the MHRA and the health regulatory agency have been commit. Uh, uh, basically requested to do a workshop mm. to identify that 60 day limit. So um, we will be working on that to basically reinforce that and uh, that will be reported through the O'Shaughnessy recommendations. So it strikes me that from what you've just said that, uh, you know, and as you said earlier, yeah, so we'll meet the statutory deadlines by the 1st of September. Uh, and then actually we'll continue to work on that competitive environment. And that's likely to take how, how long, Mark? Um, the the assurance recommendations are trying to um, actually deliver that in the next few months. Yeah. So uh, I believe um, with the, the government has said they're going to give a more detailed response in autumn. Yeah. So we'll be working on that in the meantime, but okay, we'll so give the board be... a deadline at a later date. So MHRA will actively work with our partners, including the Health Research Authority, among, among others, and then we'll be part of the government response uh, in the autumn. OK, thank you for that. Um, you had a second question, Rachel. Thanks. And the second question um, relates back to international recognition. And uh, the questioner is asking for any further information about the international recognition framework and the relationship between the MHRA and the FDA. And specifically, when will we receive further information about requirements for companies to bring a medicine to the UK using an FDA approval? OK, June, do you, want, do you want to start and you might want to bring Glenn uh, or other colleagues in? Absolutely. And at, uh, really sort of give a high level and then I'm <clears throat> sure Glenn would like to talk in more detail, um, particularly that the work on the international framework will reach a, a position of being able to be implemented from the end of the year. And a lot of work is happening to ensure that switch over takes place. Our relationship with the FDA is already very well formed in specific areas, oncology with the FDA Orbis initiative being at the forefront. But there are others that will follow, particularly I'm sure in cell and gene therapy. We've got a long-standing relationship for pediatric medicines. So we're building on a very strong foundation with the FDA. The questioner has all obviously asked, and it might be Laura as well as Glenn, when we'll be able to um, encourage companies to think of recognition of an FDA approval um, in principle from the beginning of next year. But I think Glenn might want to give a bit more detail. OK, Glenn. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I just pick up on the notion of relationships. So the the recognition model that we're using is one which is used globally, um, and that's where you don't need to enter into specific relationships agreements within with the other regulators. It's uh, similar to, to the model we use already for Europe, 
um, but expanding out to to other countries. So, as Jude said, we have relationships with the FDA uh, on a on a regular basis and work with them closely on all this. Um, they are one of a group of countries uh, regulators that will recognise from the first of uh, January next year. Um, we're hoping to have some guidance out in the coming weeks. Um, uh, we know in, we've worked with industry actually on both the process and on preparing what we can say um, in terms of guidance, um, and we'll be getting it out as soon as we can. Okay, so I think that's a very comprehensive response actually. So thank you for that, and th and thank you for the questions. So there were the questions related to the agenda. Uh, just to check then, Rachel, that uh, there were some other questions that have been raised that uh, were not relevant to today's agenda, but they will receive a written response. Yes, that's right. They'll receive a written response uh, via the Customer Experience Centre. In what sort of timescale? Uh, it will be within the next uh, 18 working days. Right. OK, so again, thank you to everyone who's been watching. Thank you for your interest uh, and, and raising the questions uh, that you have today. So that brings us on to the very last item on the agenda, which is what are the new arrangements for chairing the MHRA? And I think... Uh, really to sort of uh, bring that to uh, back to me, I'm afraid, um, after June's slightly embarrassing comments earlier, but uh, much appreciated. Um, so as has been announced uh, several months ago, I'll be stepping down as the MHRA chair at the end of today. Uh, after eight years on the board, that's five years as a non-executive director, but also three years as the chair. And in fact, I attended my first MHRA board meeting on the 20th of July, 2015 in Buckingham Palace Road, Victoria. So I think it's fair to say, and thinking about Paul's uh, earlier question about uh, the things that have changed over that time. And frankly, everything has changed, not just the physical location of the agency, um, but Brexit, Cumberledge, COVID, the rapid adv advancement of medical technologies, this board, and frankly, the agency. So I would say that literally everything uh, has, has, has changed. And it's been an absolute privilege uh, to serve as the chair alongside such a dedicated, respected and experienced chief executive as June, as well as so many other talented people in the agency. I always am, am amazed and, and inspired by the people I've met across the agency because you know there's so much skill and expertise that's available. I've also been involved in recruiting almost everybody who sat around this board table today. <laughs> Not quite everybody, but almost everybody. Um, and I think it's the people around this boardroom that gives me the confidence uh, about the future of the MHRA and gives me the confidence to step away. Um, because actually this agency does have strong leadership. It's now got excellent governance, thanks to Carly and, and, and her team. We've got a new organisation. We've got a balanced financial budget. We've got a credible three-year corporate plan. And so I think in many ways, it was the right moment for me personally after eight years to, to, to step away. And I think the agency is on the cusp of doing something really significant because I think we could really genuinely create the new medical product regulatory frameworks that will define and enable the UK life sciences industry uh, to thrive, but more importantly, to improve patient and public health across the UK and around the world. So, so I genuinely think the agency is on, on the cusp of something very, very significant. I think the chair role, my role has been advertised nationally and the advisory panel did meet on the 16th of June to review the applications and has made a shortlist. Uh, now, the appointment process for a senior role like this does require ministerial involvement and, and ministerial consultation, and that process is still ongoing. So, unfortunately, there will be a slight delay to the original uh, envisaged timetable before the interviews can actually take place. But actually, Catherine and her colleagues from the Department of Health will keep the board and, 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 and June updated on the individual progress. In the meantime, though, I'm absolutely delighted that Michael, Mandy, and Graham have agreed to act as co-chairs uh, until a new substantive chair can be appointed. So Michael will lead on the working arrangements with the Department of Health and Social Care and also with ministers. Mandy will lead on the engagement with our stakeholders uh, from a non-executive point of view. And Graham will uh, chair the, uh, the board meetings if, if a new chair is not appointed uh, before the next board meeting in September. I'm also really pleased that ministers have, have given approval to this internal solution, uh, and I think quite an important, innovative uh, yeah, solution. So that's going to be the arrangements for the new board. So just check everybody's, I think you're all aware of that, but just wanted to check that everyone's content with that. Okay.
So as far as I'm concerned, that concludes our meeting today. Um, I would just like to thank everybody who's been watching our board meeting today. I'd like to thank my board colleagues, each and every one of you, for your contributions. And also to pay, as I started at the beginning, a particular tribute to the staff at the MHRA, because that's actually really where the work gets done for everything that uh, our staff do each and every day to keep patients safe. And finally, before we leave, I'd just like to remind everyone about the purpose of the MHRA, which we've talked about a lot today, protecting and improving public health. And we're going to do that through continuing to enable scientific innovation, to accelerate patient access to new products, and to remain vigilant for potential patient safety concerns you know, for, from the use of medical products that are really vital to uh, public health in, 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 in this country. So with that in mind, I'd just like to close this meeting and say goodbye.